All right, so starting recording. So let's review a little bit from for what we did on the videotape. So nice, nice videos of the thing in process. So that was uh, one angle. Uh, but basically, if you have a foundation like that, it's like one after another. We didn't bother about the bottom plate because the foundation itself is is even enough. It's I mean it's not perfectly even, but it's decent yeah. enough so Any that alarm? we can put together. So we can put together the modules, and they pretty much remain even. All we had to do was put little shims underneath them to keep them straight, and then put on the top plate. You do want to keep the put the top plate on, otherwise you know the structure. Is much much less stability uh, we are connecting through each module so like five screws per the holding capacity of one screw is about 300 pounds on the corners you want to do the corners are most sensitive you want to button those ups um, so the proper schedule there would be like every eight inches or so uh, for the corners I would recommend if you want something that withstands like really high winds and stuff like that um, so definitely not like just two screws like I saw people left the corners at two screws some of them uh, you want to button that up quite firmly we're just using the one stud into another in the CD cajon we have that nailing plate concept where we're paying more attention to the corners for higher wind speeds um, but yeah attaching the the glazing all the glazing is actually from the last uh, the second aquaponic greenhouse uh, the polycarbonate lasts for decades, it's like a decade or two. Uh, it's a pretty good material, its advantage is it's also 3D printable, uh, quite well 3D printable. So what you saw with that that PLA print that I did, man, it's it's right there. We, if we have the material that we're making filament at low cost, where do you get that? Did you say PLA? The panels I showed yesterday, the first day, the, the the square print of the <coughs> sample that was clear PLA <laughs> oh yeah so by the way all these plastics typically come in clear form like PVC ABS <coughs> PLA it's the colors they put in them that you think you might think they're colored but no naturally a lot of these things are actually transparent so there's a lot of room for glazing with plus 3d printing uh, does PLA have any uh Decent UV resistance, I know it's not strong, but... No, but there's additives. Okay. I don't know what exactly they do. I think titanium dioxide is one thing you can do. Titanium that, dioxide? Yeah. Okay. That's what we use for sun cream. Yeah, yeah. same mm -hmm. thing. So, the more you put in it, I would say you can put up to 30%. 30% is kind of the limit, typically, when you put particles into filament before the filament doesn't have enough holding strength. But at that level, you've got you're probably going to get less translucent you might lose a little bit but I mean the polycarbonate already is like 85 percent and that's plenty of sun that's that's a lot of sun like plants aren't sun limited typically in a greenhouse like that or typically in a winter they're temperature limited if you're talking about year-round production so um, they also make this uh, just polyethylene translucent polyethylene they make double wall panels just like the polycarbonate. That's another option. We actually use that on the very first greenhouse. That's the material we had there. We had uh, that on the front side and polycarbonate on the top sides. Initially we had, just like a, in terms of technique here, the first time around for the polycarbonate on the greenhouse number one with the hydroponics, so the one that's now used as a storage structure. We had the whole thing actually slide. So just put like a rail, instead of the battens buttoning down, you put one batten and then another one over the top so you have a long rail. And we actually slid the whole thing. That works, but I mean, it's over time, uh, we kind of had it hanging by wire, but that whole four foot wide length, like after like three or four years the winds just blew that off started blowing it off even though we're kind of having pinched on the sides so then we screwed it down and then by that time it was degraded enough that the wind kept on picking it up but yeah you gotta attach this firmly so the way we're gonna do the the windows 
it are up there, we're going to do a small section that's sliding. All you need is a small section for that, wind, that airflow. So we, we're leaving a two foot section that's openable at the very top. And as I mentioned, I like the very bottom to have, so you can have this natural cross, crosswind. Uh, because the thing that in, that's in the greenhouse, you either have mechanical air pumping, like wind flow, air flow, Otherwise, you get all kinds of you get a lot of mold and fungus and and aphids. Like they love the moist environment. So part of it is you really want to keep that greenhouse like not dripping a hundred percent, but a little below, because it will get to a hundred percent easily if you close up all the windows, like all the water in there, the plant transpiration of say a thousand plants. That's huge. That's just um, as much as a water water as a plant takes. I don't, I don't know the exact figure, but like I, I would guess like a gram or two. Um, how much water does a lettuce use per day? Point one five inch. Point one five inch. Well, that's in soil. That's. But if that's anywhere comparable. Man, that's a lot. It's huge. So probably you're assuming that... Martin, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Um, yeah. No one can hear you on the channel. Well, all right. Well, the recording is still there, so I just unmuted myself. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> all right. And... How much water? So... Well, 0.15 inch, how much does an inch of water weigh? What surface area? <clears throat> One cubic inch is like 16 grams. One cubic foot, well, let's take one cubic inch. So if you have an inch, um, that's quite a bit of weight. Inch, inch of water weigh. About one gram per day. Per something like that, is that? Are you getting that from somewhere? Or? Uh, just about zero point fifteen. Uh, and if it, every inch is five. sixteen grams. Yeah, I'm getting every inch is five pounds over a square foot. So yeah, like a six would be yeah about a, a gram. No one. No, that says one. I'm not getting it. How are you? Oh yeah, one cubic centimeter. Nah. Uh, this this estimate here is if you what so actually let's talk about how much land plants use so this is like relevant to desert the point about the aquaponics is you're constantly recycling that water mm -hmm. especially if you could have like a maybe a dehumidifier that's solar powered that's in there that's trapping your water all the time or even generating the atmospheric water at 30 liters per day if you can afford the two thousand dollar machine which if you open source it it'll be much lower than that because it's it's just a bunch of plumbing so plus a refrigeration it's a refrigerator plus a bunch of plumbing so like we gotta cool it or? yeah it'll be like a compressor like in a fridge but how much is a fridge like a hundred bucks mm -hmm. so i mean the parts in there are like a hundred bucks they charge you two thousand dollars for the information content that that <laughs> the manufacturing yeah. but with 3d printing and all all else you're you're good to go to once again 3d printed appliances are a great potential or power tools huge potential there um, if one inch weighs five pounds if if lettuces are taking a sixth of an inch or 0.15 it's about a pound per day man that is huge that's for for earth grown I'm assuming that's earth grown but we've got 20 lettuces per square foot uh, we probably have like a few pounds of water per day um, we can explore that number in more detail but you're gonna have to like count your water or like if, if you have expensive water I mean water is gonna be a cost for agriculture if you're irrigating even in aquaponics but think about now probably like 10x less because it's an enclosed system and it uses water more efficiently because the number one loss of water in agriculture is just evaporation uh, most of the water goes away into the atmosphere once you water um, I mean, you, you try to water at night, of course, but still there's a whole bunch of evaporation that takes place 
just to, like just to keep the soil moist during the day it just all evaporates i mean the sun so in an aquaponic system you've got the ponds of water which are pretty much hidden so the tr the only loss is transpiration not evaporation so um how much more how much more water efficient is aquaponics it's like five or ten times um how much more efficient uh, ten times is aquaponic yeah yeah like ten times water yeah ten times more product well productive well that also means if you got 10x productivity but then also you got less so you've got first of all more productivity but second for a given area and evaporation de de term depends on the area you have right so you're getting 10x right there for productivity and and more for the actual transpiration only not evaporation so this is it's more than 10 right. it's maybe like 50 or something because it's temperate 10 times the productivity while using 90 percent well, less water. so that's like a hundred so that's where we we like that 10x 100x that's that's in line with how we want to think because um abundance is you can never have like a greedy person or a waste in a, in a scenario of abundance i mean that still requires that people are using things efficiently like the kind of idea of ancient wisdom modern technology like as soon as you start wasting stuff no matter how much you have you're always going to be short it's always have to have the wisdom to use resources efficiently to grow um, so we talked about the the windows we can do that uh, temperature so we got got to here it was kind of cool how this actually the six foot walls that that was super easy because they weren't so tall so it was easy to put these things up there relatively easy mm -hmm. and then screwing in from the bottom so we got a good connection from the bottom we first put them together so once you put them on top put them together so you eliminate those cracks in between those that's a long crack like insects will get through that so the important thing is you wanted this as much airtight as possible so here we still have to do the triangular sections so th for that we would take two by six and do a basically a triangular truss so two two long 16 footers um, we can do uh, do we have some 16s if we don't we can use like two by fours well actually we have we have a bunch of the long two by four by 16s we can do that I mean the important thing is to get the side and the top the side could even be like we could even put Instead of gla we could cut, cut the glazing, we can also do the bug screen. That would be a permanent window, so to close it up, you want, you want it closed up. But if it's hot, you'd probably like want to leave it in the summer, like just with a bug screen. Um, but you do want bug exclusion, because you, you do want to have some control over the interior environment. Until I would imagine like it gets so resilient that you have the systems feeding into each other, and actually the exterior bugs, external bugs, are not even an issue. Uh, like, for example, if you have your foliar sprays of I, I mentioned compost tea right that is also insecticidal uh, so it, it tends to it, it's all about promoting the plant health and it, at, at which point if plants are very healthy they can resist a lot of things but as soon as they get weak they get attacked completely and in artificial systems you typically kind of tend to breed less resilient organisms so the resilience part the strength of the plant that's like literally the only the, the main thing you want to go for um, okay so that's the review from yesterday what, what else to observations comments from yesterday other other observations or comments um, the glazing didn't line up properly with the modules everywhere it might just be the foundation that makes the rest like sort of unplumb mm -hmm. but they're all on there. It's tight mm -hmm. enough. Yeah. Yep. I think it went very quick. Mm -hmm. It was quite rewarding. Yeah. Then the pond itself. For the pond, we're using two by twelve by uh, ten foot by six, like we calculated in the morning session, to prevent the bottom from bulging out. We nailed two by two by fours into the ground so that the bottom board cannot oh. shift out. You got all the weight of the water most of the weight of the water at the bottom and after that we actually reinforce the corners because uh, that's 
like those screws can pull out like if you're going into the end grain because on one side when we screw the box basically like this at some point you have to screw through the end grain and that's a very weak connection you, you typically want to be going cross grain in wood but the end grain screws they pull out much easier so on the edges we put two by sixes or two feet kind of a corner another corner to reinforce all of that screwed into only thing is if you're using the, these three inch screws you got to pay attention to if you're poking through the entire three inches so typically we like to do them at a small angle so you don't because that will puncture your polyethylene water barrier we'll do a double layer polyethylene barrier so it has kind of like double the resiliency um, and that should that, it works well I mean uh, may not be like lifetime design of like a hundred years because you know someone falls on a polyethylene you might get a cr break in it or whatever but it's works for a number of years it's a very low cost thing next step up being things like EPDM like or like roof li pond liner roof liner like what we actually use on the house that's like I, I believe that's 20 or 40 mil uh, much thicker uh, so it it'll just last long it would last longer like they, they do permanent ponds with the pond liners which are EPDM typically so beyond that what else do we want to do on a pond so it's three feet high about we do want to put a bar across it like a, I'm suggesting a piece of rebar weld two angles on top and just screw it into the side so just a little weld job there we can do that real quick but something that holds the the middle from bulging out because you have no protection against this kind of motion right now there's nothing. It's the strength of the wood, but the wood is quite flexible along the, the long direction. It'll bow out and um, weaken the joints. Richard was asking, can you just caulk those joints up? Well, in a wood, in a wood structure, the wood will move. You cannot do simple caulking or like some kind of a like plastic seal because the wood will just move too much it's like it expands and shrinks uh, so typically those kinds of techniques are used in if you have concrete or CB or some some very solid material like you know like say the CB walls of this house they're not gonna go anywhere you can make a pond out of them um, they're structural they're just heavy just heavy weight and that's they're not gonna move so uh, if we did a round pond Go ahead, Ken. Sorry, uh, just a question about the caulking. You mean yeah. instead of using a pond liner? Yeah. Why not just caulk the seams between the wood? I mean, caulk is strong, right? And that wouldn't normally work if that wood didn't move, like it didn't bow out, or maybe. But what about um, you know when you do ship building? Uh, How do they do it? Yeah. Well, those uh, those are like beams. They're huge, so they're not going to move. I think, right? I mean, they're it's very structural, and I don't know the technique what they use in shipbuilding. Haven't I think done it, but spot welding, I think. well, I mean that's steel, well, but in wood, I'm assu assuming wood ships of long time ago, they're yeah. made of well, the, the just oldest wood. ship in the world in, in uh, ancient Egypt they found intact. They actually sold the wood together with just like ropes, like that's how oh, it was yeah. held together. Yeah, I mean, I imagine. I, well, like every every plank of board was literally like woodman stitched together, like in. I well, know. I would assume that the. It's a special technique, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I would assume unless they had perfect planing, which would take a long time, they were probably putting some caulk of yeah, theirs I think at the time. Using so. Some sort of insulation or something like that, like. Uh, Do you have to? Because I mean. No, like. Water will find a tiny crack yeah, and but if it's, sink your ship. If you take a wooden boat into water and it has a bit of water for a while, it's going to leak, and then it soaks up water. All the boards yeah. swell up. That's what happens. And it self seals. Yeah. And then oh, you, can, you can use tar on it to keep the wood good, but you you let the boards expand. But the first okay. hour or so, it's gonna leak. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think okay. I use like some like cedar though, not pine that uh, they use in two by fours. Uh, yeah, it's not really meant to be yeah. soaked with like cool. that. Because they build like also like hot tubs and saunas out of cedar too. Yeah, and again they they yeah or teak. they come already pretty high in moisture. Yeah, without a liner. Yeah, you can use them with a liner, but you have to use a steel band to close them because <laughs> you need that pressure. Or pressure. what about how do they do barrels? Same technique. Same way, yeah. 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 No. 
It's but you have not. a nice band that keeps it all tight, yeah, and then the pressure right. just builds up and it kind of self seals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, to your point, like you have me wondering, like how not how it fools me, but I'm wondering if I use it, if I'm trying to make it tough as well. If I if I did use the EPM line or something like that, how would you put any type of additional materials on top of that? You have to you know, use adhesives or something. I'm, I'm just trying to uh, think. Additional like, materials for what like, purpose? Let's say you wanted to use you know ceramics, concrete, any you know wallpaper, anything to so you don't so your final finish isn't the liner, right? If you wanted another finish on top of your liner. With a liner, you get into the issue that if you're attaching anything mechanically, then you're poking through the liner, so that won't do it. You'd have to, I mean, typical thing for pools, it's it's concrete and tile. So um, con concrete, then some kind of a backing for the tile. Like how do they do pools? That's a lot, a lot of labor, like for a nice finished thing. Uh, so what's an easy way to do that? Well, it's it's really a good one. one. Um, who said that? Um, how, like Katrina's, the, the pond we have, the pool there, that's pretty, I mean, it's aesthetic, but you can't do anything after the liner that would penetrate it. So that's, that's yeah, a hard that, one. Right. That was part of the trick of doing this pool is to, I, I wanted to do, like, you can, you can cut into the liner and then you can seal it, but all of those, every, every puncture is going to be a potential uh, leak at some point. So I, for me, the challenge was trying to, to do it all so that the liner is not punctured at all. So what we did is very unusual, like no one does it the way we did it. Um, a, t a typical pool, you can have the, okay, the typical pool is you would have walls that are stuccoed. So they're basically, it doesn't matter how you build them, as long as at the end what you end up is with stucco. Usually they'll do like cinder blocks that have rebar through them and they're filled with concrete. And then uh, in the end, you basically apply a stucco, like a Portland cement stucco to it. And then they have, you can put the tiles, but the tiles are mostly decorative. And actually, they will be problematic to find leaks. But then what you do is uh, take a paint. It's just, it's basically a paint that seals the stucco. And that's what seals your, it's a specific pool paint. Uh, that's what seals your pool. I would have done that, except that like it's a lot heavier. So if it was a big group of people, that probably possibly makes more sense than the wood. Thank you. Cost-wise. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. If we do so, the potential, like for example, CB cisterns. I thought about that a long time ago. But if you use the basket technique, the the stucco with mesh on both sides, you do a good job on a stucco and you paint it, that would work. That would be a good, like say a round structure because the bricks are so heavy, but you gotta pay attention, like how are you joining to the floor? Like, is there gonna be a crack there that's gonna leak and stuff like that? So you, you wanna have probably the CBs, like if you do that, CBs and everywhere. So you can do a uniform, nice coat of stucco on it. If you get some paint on it or some kind of a sealer, yeah, I mean, you're, you're pretty good. I mean, the stucco, that's known technology, um, so that, that would work. There'll be some works. That's where the, the pond liners are quite convenient for an easy way to do it. So thinking, thinking also about the larger scale 3D printing or 3D printable structures that you maybe have. Like I was thinking, okay, how do we do that pond? And it's a lot of work. You either have to get all this, this liner, you have to dig this big hole, you have to stabilize the sides. Well, say we had the hole and we had to, we had to stabilize it. What, what do you do? So 3D printed sections, like imagine you can print like U sections that maybe like slide into each other with a gasket that is sealing. Like that would be a good design problem. Uh, I haven't really thought much about it outside of the general concept. Um, but imagine sections that you can print and then you can make long structures like that any length so you can do whatever you want if you have this 4 by 4 by 8 size kind of a printer or even even linear planks that they have a gasket that kind of like slides into each other I like say you got this kind of a s sliding gasket uh, so one member you know one two three some kind of a gasket maybe like a Google what a gasket is on a window yeah but some kind of a similar thing because you can print in multiple materials rubber being one of them right so this is also another great problem statement for modular 3d printed water vessels 
that would be a good thing. Um, cool thing for modularity is if you can print the complex geometries with 3D printing, yeah, you can do, you can make those connections happen. Like for example, for domes, like domes are impossible to seal up properly. I mean, because they've got all the triangles and all that. It's really, really hard job, but not if you have 3D printing because you can print all those geometries. So um, once again, the potential for 3D printing and construction is, is great. Um, so let's let's continue. Uh, any other observations from the build yesterday? Um, yeah, more screws, like screws on a polycarbonate. Let's actually uh, uh, go to the working dock and, and just talk about some finishing detail, like quality control. Uh, so we make sure that the pond doesn't leak, <laughs> mm -hmm. that we don't get bugs in there. So so watertight, airtight, um, but not so watertight like for the roof it's fine if you get dribbles in between the cracks from the rain but you want to be small enough that you don't get a lot of bugs going in there like mosquito like either well I mean cabbage moths I mean they're big so they wouldn't get in um, don't leave more than like a millimeter of space so things don't like other unwanted animals don't get in there for mice you can't have a hole more than like a quarter inch because baby mice get through that so for example, when I was doing the nuts, uh, that greenhouse wasn't particularly mouse-proof. And it's very hard to mouse-proof a, a structure, any structure. Uh, you have to be very careful. Uh, but there we had to just set a ton of traps everywhere. And we would catch mice all the time because they would just eat all your nuts. They, they love them. They smell those nuts from a mile away. And it's a, it's a mouse magnet. So we had to be very careful about um, having a bunch of traps in there. So, so what, what should we seal on those cracks with? Because there's plenty. Um, well, the first thing would be like, see if you can button them up with, with screws. But other than that, I mean, we could use tape, like, like the, how about using the, the house wrap tape? That's one good option. House wrap tape? Yeah, it's the red stuff. It's not the white, the white stuff would definitely work. That's, um, we don't need to do that. The other thing is just uh, let's uh, take out some bug screen. You could staple it if oh, there's yeah. major cracks. Uh, you could caulk it, but then it's gonna be hard to take them apart. Yeah. Um, so one, just bug screen. One of the roof places. modules, it wouldn't come down. One of the 16 feet roof modules yeah. uh, at the higher up end. Um, so there's like an inch. I think where one, one side's off and it, it doesn't come back. Okay. Yeah, to address things like that, probably someone will have to step on it or use a clamp to do that. If, if it's possible to take off a couple of screws and just clamp it, that's, yeah, the clamp that's is one too, solution. Too small for those joints to get on top and under. You know we have the big clamps, right? Like the pipe clamps? No, I don't. Well, that's so there's <laughs> a pipe clamp, looks like this. The old fashioned ones? Pipe. It's these things, like the pipe on this can be any length. I have seen so, that one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have those. Um, the pipe, you know, four feet, oh, you can whatever. Those too. Uh, oh, yeah, nice. if you do a lot of clamping strength, that would be a heavy, heavy 3D print. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, these, these things do work. So, so maybe um, record some of those notes here. So after this, so let's talk about sealing for bugs, ceiling structure for bugs, because that's, I mean, it's important if you're going to do this for actual production and you want this thing to, for you to be on top of the, all the bugs that get in there. Uh, so let's talk about quality control. So that is mainly The problem statement there is <coughs> uh, let's just do so problem statement. Keep bugs. I mean, 
mice, if you're doing, like for example, in a nut operation, if you're breeding nuts, like, yeah, that is very important. But for now, it's like keep bugs out of greenhouse and the ones that are in, in. So ideally, uh, like if you're, for your ladybugs, if you had your, because they seem to like disappear all of a sudden. And I think it's, there's a mass exodus at some point because they just, I don't know, I think that's what they do. Um, but if you see them, hmm? Yeah, they're gonna eat all your aphids. They're hungry and they're gonna just go elsewhere. So, because they do that, they're very effective at it. They just gobble them up. So, keep bugs out of greenhouse, but you can also say, keep the beneficials in. Like for example, there's uh, pest controls for spiders. So, uh, I think that's a, that's a good one. Yeah, there's whole world of complexity we can get into there uh, with the whole biological system. And second, second, so uh, leak-proof pond, leak-proof low-cost pond. All right, so just some points. So use bug screen for cracks. So the bug screen are basically. Yeah, like you can cut strips of buck screen, just staple it. That would be an easy thing to do right now for if we've got certain thing, certain visible cracks. Um, that would be a good practice. Um, and cold, like weather. Um, like well, it's for weather too. Yeah. Like how would you? Uh, once it's gonna be winter, you're gonna have to seal it eventually. Right? Close all the windows, and then until the very coldest days of January, there's enough thermal mass that you you're gonna keep that. They are gonna keep it warm. Themselves. If you have like the 1,200 gallons, like four totes of water, that takes quite a bit of time for that to go to freezing. Mm -hmm. So if you got a sunny day, it's only when you have this extended, maybe like you got a snow and it's you're not getting a lot of sunlight in there and you've got like a week or two of cold weather then you're gonna start freezing stuff in there but short of that it's it's got enough thermal mass in there but what's the disadvantage of the the concrete there that's gonna be a nice heat sink that's for the winter that's gonna be transporting a lot of cold because it's a big thermal bridge like right now you can feel the concrete it's nice and warm so it's actually good, it helps you out for a little bit of time, but then it traps, it, it just gets cold from the weather, and then it works against you, because it's like on the bottom of the pond, we should actually insulate it to keep it out of that, because that's gonna be like freezing, as cold as the outside, and that's pretty much gonna transport into the structure, outside of what the heating does inside the structure. How could we, could we heat in a low cost? PV. PV and resistors. So, so water tank heaters, you know, like the the electric water tanks. It's a low cost way to do it. Uh, the heater element costs like five bucks for like three kilowatts or five kilowatts up to. It's like a dollar a kilowatt. How do you do it to be any? Uh, I mean, it's kind of wasteful. But if you have a lot of PV, that's one way to do it. If you have unused like say doing a lot of operations in the summer like here maybe in the winter we're not using a lot of the PV possibly because we're kind of off season funnel that into the greenhouse uh, that's the high-tech way but it's very easy because uh, you take a water tank so how do you do this in terms of actual build water tank heater element so you get one of, it's not water tank, it's a uh, water heater, water heater element. These things only cost a few bucks, uh, but if you get one that's 240 volts, handles a lot, of, a lot of power, they're like five kilowatts easy and like five bucks, very cheap. <clears throat> so if you have PV, 
or in emergencies if you've got a cold day and you really need to heat it using grid electricity it's going to cost you a bit but you got to do it. it's like heating a house but that way you can save your system so what i would do actually so how do you do this how do you wire it up so it's safe well uh you need you need to you definitely need to put it put some kind of a shroud so it doesn't touch the sides but just make a submersion heater element how do you do it you connect two regular wires put a tube around it pour potting compound in there to make it airtight watertight seal on that on that end so you got a dangling thing on two wires which are already insulated and you got potting compound the same stuff they use to seal up electronics like you see some electronics that have this silicone black or? it's not silicone it's okay. it's an epoxy yeah so I it's completely it. I, yeah. yeah it's completely waterproof so you seal that up dip it in there done that's a five dollar heater element plus some epoxy and a, a short stub of PVC pipe for the end um, so we have the, we have done that for example in a hydronic stove um, in Jeff's house we have one of these sticking into the stove for when you're not running the stove in the winter if you, you want to walk away you can just turn that on to keep keep the water hot I actually did do this I put this an element just like this submerged it um, what I did there was actually do a long PVC pipe so I didn't use potting compound since I didn't have it on hand so I just put this long tube and just caulk up or like whatever I used there I forget what I used um, so the heater element the wires were going in there no water was in there I just ran that ran that for some time for heating actually of the PV panels on the faculty house and there's PV panels up there that we just ran a wire from there to to the heater it, it works but I mean yeah for, for that that example like water gets in there you'll get short circuits so it's not good but yeah you can do this you can do this as an easy way or thermal like solar thermal um, but for solar thermal yeah you, you have to prove you know there are solar like pretty cool like solar thermal evacuated tubes Does it run Maybe on DC those DC or AC so it's very oh. flexible you can put any voltage on it and yeah. it will work at yeah, any course. voltage mm -hmm. so it's a very easy, easy thing yeah, yeah. Just losing energy. so for example <laughs> so like string inverters high power PV systems string up a bunch of your panels each of them are like 30 volts the safe voltage for house wiring is about 600 so you string up 20 of them and then do like th like two or three three of these heater elements so 240 times 3 720 and you're running like the 600 volt DC from your panels like that's like a such a simple thing to do like no power electronics involved it just whatever power the the PVs have that's what gets put into the the water so that's an easy way and the heating part the heater element itself it's all it's meant to be in water so it's that's sealed on the hot side you just have to protect the the wire wire connection there but it does have a thread there it's already threaded there so you can say 3d print so here yeah here would be the best thing like 3d print a fitting screw that into a little fitting with uh, with a lip on it pour your potting compound in there and then you have your watertight heater element like that and you can even 3d print like a little shroud so it's you know a bunch of holes in it so that when you submerge it it doesn't hit the sides so you, you don't melt anything because it'll be hot around it uh, the only thing you got to worry about is in regular water you get buildup of like algae or whatever if it's not running or it's kind of because it's a high high temperature thing it tends to get a lot of settling on it so you kind of have to clean it every once in a while um, so in which case if you talk about zero maintenance you know that wouldn't do you'd have to clean it like every month or something but if you wanted zero maintenance then you have to do a heat exchanger route so for example as simple as the 55 gallon drum wound with 100 or 200 feet of the PEX that was our heater for the uh, for the aquaponic greenhouse that works great I mean the water gets all the heat into the water and never really cleaned it it, it pretty much mm that was good but it's a heat exchanger route where the fluid medium is clean all the time so whatever's heating like if you're using an, an electric heater that that heater element never gets dirty and the temperature at the PV at the PEX is low enough it's it's your nice hot water that it doesn't 
tend to cause a lot of settling of things on it. And it's all, you know, get, get algae growing on it and stuff like that. But that's still, as long as it's very wet, it kind of still conducts the heat quite well. So like in a whole two, three years or four years, uh, three or so years of running that heater in there, probably three or four years. Yeah, I mean, never had to clean or anything. So, so that was a good route, the very simple route of the PEX heater submerged in, in water. So that's a good route. Okay, but moving on to, uh, so use bug screen for cracks. Um, corners have like eight screws in it. Corners have eight screws minimum. Um, for the pond, we have to make sure that those those reinforcing bars, the, the wood bars that we put in uh, with concrete nails, they just stay. But I think that's a pretty decent connection. We want to make sure that the corners are buttoned up and we're ready for the polyethylene. And then we're not puncturing that thing anywhere on the bottom. It's like it's immersion heaters, immersion heaters, immersion pumps. You don't have to have a bung or something at the bottom, which is a leak point. Um, what do you do? So, yeah. Uh, polyethylene, there's a, tr uh, a way you can fold the corners so that they get very neat, like as opposed to, like you can crumple up the polyethylene and make like this, this funky corner, but there's a way you can fold it in a very neat way that it's completely square. So we can do that. Um, this is just a pattern you have to follow. So um, that's, there's some trick. Let's see if we can find it. So like, how to fold a square corner. Sort of like the way you do when you do gift prepping, I guess. It's, it's like kind of like that, it's like origami. Yeah. So um, how to do a square corner with polyethylene. How to fold corners, yeah, you'll find a bunch of stuff on it, I guess. Perfect, um, serving artists since 1868. Yeah, so this is artist stuff. Perfect corners. Folding corners on your Pro Dixie Stretch It Yourself canvas kit. No, that's different. But it's Folding similar to that. You basically have to make a fold that steps. goes at a 90 degree, like it creates this 90 degree. Yeah. And then you got to do it again. But First, fold your canvas 45 degrees. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of like that. It's kind of what they're showing. Now, fold your canvas up. Yeah, so you have to make that fold align with the the line there, and then you got to fold it again. It's probably easiest to explain it in practice. Let's see it again. Uh, corner with polyethylene pond liner. Let's see. Uh, I don't know. Pond liner tutorial outside corner. Yeah, you gotta kind of, you know, the the trickery is at the boundaries. All the interfaces, like all the action happens at the boundary, whether at OSC or in whatever. <laughs> um, a lot of interesting stuff happens there. I mean, you can do that kind of stuff where you're using glues and stuff like that, but you can make a fold that's completely waterproof up to the very top. And so, but no, it's it's a little different than this. We'll we'll just do that in practice. Mm -hmm. um, so corners. So then pond liner, which is just polyethylene, poly pond liner. Um, Barn pole barn screws. So let's um, screws down the middle of polycarbonate. So what are pole barn screws? Just so you know, you know what those are. That's that's a good way to go. They don't they don't come off. That seems to work well. Otherwise, you just use a batten down the middle as well. If you don't have those screws. Um, Those things with a washer. Are um, they uh, good enough to use all around instead of battens, or just kind of in the middle where they're not necessarily load bearing? No, I wouldn't use them around all the outside. You need all that force, okay. I would say. Copy. Copy this image. Yeah, use these pole barn screws down the middle. For the battens, screw every 
like 18 inches no less no, no more than that like I see a places where it's like like this kind of distance do it a little more tight because you want to keep that on um, not coming off also for like air infiltration and there's all these little cracks add up like uh, an average house has like a apparently like a window sized crack happening at all times <laughs> however, however much but yeah there's like little gaps they add up um, and air can get into anything if you have a high wind you'll notice we actually do notice that on a CD go home on, on very windy days it's it's actually much cooler inside because there must be enough cracks and one of the main challenges for the panelized construction is is the good tight fit between the panels and that's that's something that where the quality control of very nice even foundations and controlling the lumber how you build it making sure it's straight or as straight as possible for what you have or throwing out things that are just really bad um, you have to do that kind of stuff otherwise you're gonna get all these holes and it's it's like not not gonna be bad in like warm climates but if you're really paying attention to zero energy homes and and high level of of thermal insulation that really matters and if you, so if you're like in a windy area like the house we built, you know, if you, if you got wind all the time and super cold, it's it's going to get expensive in the winter to heat it. So it's just a consideration. Uh, it's important. Um, so, for example, like the screws every 18 inches at least. I mean, if you think about it, like that batten can kind of like bend up a little bit. So it's like more like even every foot you'd want it. And actually, in the real conditions, we would do six inches on the edge. For, for the long term so we don't get any broken screws that come from this thing flapping in a wind um, the screws down the middle is basically for flapping with the wind and, and over time if you have enough of that flapping like even the edges are going to come out uh, they're going to just start breaking from from the wood so you need that middle I think that's the main points for quality control uh, so let's talk about systems then that we want to build Um, let's go to aquaponic. Well, where are we going to? So, so the where are we going to aquaponic greenhouse? And there's a bunch of documents on all the the mechanical subsystems. So I'm gonna just put a link. Um, aquaponic greenhouse. So basically, mechanical systems. So prepare all the mechanical systems for populating it with wildlife tomorrow. Um, but we can get into a bunch, including starting preparing the watering and automation parts. So, okay, so here's our main aquaponic greenhouse page. But here are the designs. Like, this is a pretty important page. So the biggest thing is um, the growing towers. And that's that's the idea. We've got a bunch of these already prepared. We've got we've got a detailed instruction for how to do it. Um, what goes inside is this two by four uh, piece of it's called reticulated foam. So here are the build instructions, and it's detailed. It's got bills of materials like where you get this stuff. So you start with four by ten PVC pipe. If you're more eco, you can go to polyethylene pipe. If you don't like PVC. Um, which will be twice as expensive, but you get just regular um, solid core, solid PVC sewer drain pipe like this, uh, four feet, four inch by ten. So we're using just four inches. That's plenty of room. Like how big for the pipe? I mean, six inches, four inches. Four inches is enough for the roots. Like the root mass is you know, like a nice ball. You want the main consideration there would be, I think, weight. Because uh, once you get that whole reticulated foam wet with water and you've got six inches, like four inches is quite convenient because then the towers are light enough so you can still carry them. Like you can easily, say you want to replace a tower, say your planting system involves uh, where you take the tower and put it to your work table and you actually plant it conveniently so you're not leaning over the pond and falling in there or whatever. Uh, so these are designed to be light enough to be carried by a single person so you can just take it off the hook and go to your workstation if you want to but but I guess we'd want to set up the greenhouse where uh, you've got automated planting with our auto auto seeder and then you take a tray 
take one tray, put in those deep pots into the, the holes, which as I mentioned the other day, the deep pots happened to fit in the same holes. That was kind of an accident because we did the nuts and we had all these pots and we said, hey, why not just grow these things like the nuts, which you do 100 trays for mass production, right? So here you're talking mass production. You've got this one tray. It's got 100 deep pots that your FarmBot automated system, FarmBot slash universal access, FarmBot, it's called FarmBot based universal access seeder. So it's called the universal access seeder. You got this all planted automatically. You take that, so zero time on your side, except of putting seeds into the seed trays of the seeder. So now you take that into the towers and every few seconds you're, you're feeding, your, you're taking out an old one if you harvested it. So say you harvested, then you want to replant. Everything's out of the tower. You got the black, the holes, insert the deep pots in there. So there's the deep pots that actually work. All they need to do is make sure that the bottom part where the holes are, that gets to the water flow so the roots get, get moist. Do or you, you can do little pot. Hmm? A video or something to explain it. Because we cannot understand ah. the system. I see. Yeah, let's let's go to the pic in our in our doc. This would be I'll show you some pictures at least or in a video. Um, no, that was kind of a thing we stumbled upon. So here you see the the regular towers. You you see things growing in there. You can basically put the plant but you want to keep the root mass in some kind of a little net pot. They're called net pots. So you saw the net pots here the other day. Uh, but let's see, let's get a close up. And basically you can control the, the size of, of lettuce or any plant according to the size of the root, right? Like if the, if the pot is small. Yeah, I mean... The, yeah, but now the, the roots, they can go through the entire reticulated foam medium. They can go, if you have the tower even in water, they'll be in water. Mm -hmm. So if you have plants that don't mind water, watered roots, like for example, watercress, you're going to have like the bottom with watercress, that's the roots are going all over the pond and stuff like that too. So, yeah. which but that's, that's very good for the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's awesome. So... Uh, let's see, do I see any pictures of that? Okay, you see them right there. So what, what you see in that tower, what do you see in there? I've got the deep pots right in all the holes. So those are those six inch pots mm -hmm. right in the holes. Very convenient. And then you take it out? Yeah, so if you harvest it, how do you go to market? Just take them all out alive put them on your tray, take them to market, and if you don't sell them, put them back in the hole to grow. So the, the, it's yeah, fresh. The, the pot, you just take the pot out. Take, the, take that, take it out, put it into your, your 100 tray. Yeah. Uh, so how does that 100 tray look? I mean, that was way down here with the, all the nuts. Wait, um, doesn't the root get into the foam? Like well, if it's that much, Okay. Well, if you have that much and you've got perlite or other growth medium, a lot mm -hmm. of the root will be, that's a lot of, a lot of the root will already be there. So if you have like a lettuce, that's just, you know, a baby one like that, most of the roots will be there. Even if you damage it, hey, that's fine. They'll regrow the roots. So mm -hmm. yeah, the roots will come out those bottom holes you and you can get this huge, you can cut it, you can do whatever. I'm just saying like, uh, you can actually take your, because the towers are human sized, you got your van, you got our white van and you hang those towers in the back and you take and market that way and you have a show at market, right? Awesome. So, so that, that's another way to do it. I mean, the potential here is like with this modularity is crazy. I, I mean, this what I'm saying, this is this revenue model on, on this little puppy here is, <laughs> is uh, it, quite it's amazing. Fresh at the moment, like really fresh. You pick yeah. it up mm -hmm. there because it's still swimming yeah. and it's foamy. Uh, yeah, and, <laughs> and my experience has been I went to market, one hour I was out of there, s sold a hundred lettuce plants mm -hmm. for a dollar. I was selling for like a dollar, dollar fifty or something. So I came home with like 150 bucks after an hour. Great. So, so they, they can buy the lettuce plus the design guide on how to build their own. Of course. <laughs> that <too. laughs> and that will be your, your second uh, product offering at your booth. Here's training for how to do it. <laughs> so 
it's the same so we planted out the the nuts into these little holes we took the nuts and plant them here same pots same little pots and those pots could actually come in like there's a six inch version and like a nine inch version so you can do both uh the small ones actually fit right well within the holes um but otherwise you've got things like what's that in there that's a little net pot so it's just a little 3d printed net pot which you can hardly see there but um so how does this system look? Um, so in places like, for example, uh, so that's basil, like basil and, and um, mint. mint are going to take over your greenhouse. Basil, you can take an offshoot because that grows root. It's vegetatively propagated. You can just take an offshoot that's mint or basil. And you just throw it right in a hole. No medium needed. No pot because the roots will just start growing into the, the wet medium. Because it's all wet, it's like 100% humidity in there. It's, it's dribbling down all day uh, if you have it on like that. So, why do this you is a very to cool... To begin with? Like, why not just let the water drip? Uh, that would turn it into aeroponic. So yeah, you could have like a tube. No, the holes would have to be plugged up. Mm. Otherwise, like oh, if you let so. it drip, the, the roots need some kind of a structure to attach to otherwise okay. the plants would fall out okay uh, so it's it's struck you need structure and you need lightweight structure because otherwise those towers when we fill them full of soil they are like literally like close to 100 pounds each well they're inside the net pots though right there yeah should be enough structure but i think the the foam is to transfer the water to the ends of the ones because otherwise it just sits yes. in the middle it never hits anything Exactly. Because uh, I know I built one for the hydroponics and I had to yeah. build like a little net so that it rains on the sides because otherwise it won't reach the plants. Uh -huh. Yes. And the plants will grow all their roots into the reticulated foam. They will do that. They'll... What, what type of foam is it? What, what material? It's sponge. Sponge material. Uh, it's like some polyurethane thing. And, as I mentioned, worms started living in that foam too. How? I mean, they got somewhere, they got seeded in there. Um, but that, so does that clarify the yeah. the pot directly in the yeah then the ultimate automated seeder right uh, have you already done it no no, it's, it's a new no um, so let's go to the design dock we have the universal axis and we, we can put heads on it and that's a tiny pump. So let's go to drive and, and just put a link to the, the dock. So there's all these docks. We have we have a bunch of stuff on this because we, you know, we've been at, at this. Um, there's this one, the greenhouse nursery module. So, so this is actually talking more about what I was talking about the other day with respect to the all the shelves but here actually so let's actually look at this this page here um, as we're uh, let's link that to here so like all the builds that's um, let's do Uh, how do we get into all these other systems? Um, well, yeah. but, but let's we're jumping. So let's go first to finish off the. Uh, so, so go to Aquapana Greenhouse. Go to the towers. So let's nail the towers. Like what's all required for that? We have a bunch of them that we can just pretty much hang up and what does that mean? So screws, uh, the three inch screws work well there. I mean, they can hold like a hundred pounds uh, each easily. So aqua, let's just go through the dock of how we build, um, build the G towers first. So we'll hang them. Um, if you guys want, we can take some four inch pipes, do the markings. So let's look at the instructions. Let's see how much instructions are in here. No, not here. They're, they're in this dock right here. 
Uh, let's, I mean, let's take a look at some pictures for, for what this looks like in practice. So what you'll do is take these tubes. So this will be the first, this is the first hanging joint. Uh-huh. And he'll hang up from the rafter. Yeah. And then he'll insert. You slip two the of them in, so it's a modular uh -huh. system. And friction fit it with You can friction fit or you uh -huh. can screw it in. And then we're doing a man-made coupling down here. Okay. And, ex and do the same thing. We'll glue it to one and then we'll mechanically fasten it to the other. And this makes them portable. Okay. His idea is you could possibly take these apart in sections. So you can hang, hang them in the back van, of your van. Go to a farmer's market or co-op. Mm -hmm. Hang them up, sell them. Whatever doesn't sell, you just come right back up, hang them up. Okay. Put them together and you're back in business and growing. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah. And these three feet sections are more manageable. Those are five foot sections. There's also the foam that goes in here to grow media. Okay. It's in three foot lengths. And there's already our mock up pieces are in there. Okay. And you'll see that there's a big box of foam. <laughs> Do we have any more bottles? Okay. Oh, you so we basically take mark lines. So there's about a, like a 70 degree angle between the two rows of of the holes, you mark a slit, cut it with a circular, circular saw, no, a cutoff saw. It's a small slit you're cutting in the edge of it. Take a heat gun, which means like heat guns and plastic, they totally make plastic completely pliable to do whatever you want. So then you put in a, a bottle, like the head of a, like a soda bottle or something like that and just ream it out um, <coughs> to get that nice, complex geometry shape there. This is what you mean by a heat gun? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Exactly that. And I mean you can't you'll see that if you're yeah. melting you want to melt the thing. Hey Jeff. Hey. How's everything? Hello. What's up? I'm just checking my link. We're just mind our own business here. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Regarding these, just a couple more more pictures on this. So, you see those slits there? Yeah. I mean pretty simple like the the bottle you, you draw those two lines and ream, ream out the, the slits that you cut with with a bottle oh you see this one actually has three sides we typically yeah we did both versions where it's like I think two or three sides I think most of them we have as the two sides uh, from what I remember but you can do them all around uh, if you have less light, or maybe younger plants, or plants that need less light on the back, you can do them all around. Now, in fact, would be an even cooler system for highlight growing all around. Well, put a little motor on the top and rotate, like a little hydraulic motor. That's actually an interesting addition because then you're actually tapping the full, uh, full volume that you can handle with this because the backside. If you give it more light, yeah, you're definitely going to get more productivity. Mm -hmm. And the plants are not limited by the amount of light they have. It's, to, well, they are. Let's see. Light is important. In, in this climate here, the, the temperature is even more important. But yes, if you do rotate this, that would be an interesting system. So that would be a case for some, um, maybe some kind of a simple hydraulic motor, a water run motor that's 3D printed that lasts forever, it doesn't decompose like metals. Uh, so a simple hydraulic motor that's actually pumped by the same pumping system that you've got pumping through this. You could do that. I mean, you can do a, like those sprayer pumps, they have enough pressure, they got like 20 to 50 PSI or up to 100 PSI. You can run a tiny hydraulic motor. So let's take a look at a 3D printed hydraulic motor. 3D printed water motor. You can do this. Uh, not too much sweat on that. Uh, have never done it, done this, but they've got various designs. These are typically like ones like this are veins, which would spin very fast. But you also have the ability to print helical gears very effectively with 3D printing. So you put a little gear down on it, 
and there you've got your nice little rotor it cost you 30 cents in materials so that's where it gets once again the 3d printing gets quite interesting there I guess like for example 3d printed water pump yeah I mean these water pumps you can make this kind of stuff the question is how good your design is and how efficient it is but you can definitely do it and this is a case once again where you'll find probably like a lot of poor designs and some that might be really good or maybe none that are really good because actually when you do make it really good typically disappears from the open source so mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the typical thing that happens so <laughs> so you get a bunch of you're, you're selecting for inferior product and uh, unfortunately that's a negative side of open source it kind of selects well but that's not true open source because that's like actually the opposite of open source where people are not sharing the improvement so it's mm -hmm. so actually open source true open source means that the best best things emerge um, does not happen a lot that's that's a weakness of the open source hardware model at this point at least that uh, anytime anybody gets something really good they close it up so that's a challenge to overcome as far as the specific instructions for this so let's let's just continue on this and I'm sorry before you move away with the towers yeah. uh, just to be clear you're saying if, if, if you could uh, provide supplemental lighting or uh, whatever <laughs> it would be possible to run a parallel hole on the other side of each of the ones that are there now so in the future if you're able to food density yeah so you're like <clears throat> up to doubling your capacity if you're growing in a backside because the backside is what doesn't get a lot of sun might be in a shade but if you just give it enough give that extra 20 30 percent or something uh it might just be enough to get it to its like full growth potential and stuff like that because typically you'll see like the things in the shade they're going to get like weak and lanky and stuff like that so they would definitely need more sun so um i mean the full instruction is here like for people who want to make make this reticulate your ureth urethane foam there's the source right there uh, Hipco Plastics, hipco.com, it's all there. Uh, they're two by three and a half inch by three foot pieces. Uh, okay, so actually the towers we're making, it appears they're more like three foot long pieces. Well, did we do three feet? I thought we did five feet. Um, maybe they're just three foot sections. Um, so de water resistant deck screws. Deck screws are typically exterior rated. You need some hanger wire you got to hang these things on a nail so hanger wire is something like this just something that's coated like maybe uh, hanger wire which is just heavy wire that you can hang the towers on you could do like fence wire as well I used fence wire um, what else tools needed miter saw drill so you start with a quarter inch uh, drill bit uh, why do you do that you what's the procedure there cut pipes in half no we're doing five foot pieces mark three inches from the top vertical column Ma mark every six inches below so the, basically the whole pattern uh, so, so yeah we're doing the two uh, two columns like the picture you saw there that was like three slots uh, but we kind of ended up with two because th that's the light limits on the back side so um, so you're marking, you, you draw two vertical lines, just marks. I don't know where that drill bit comes in, but all we're doing is miter saw on that slit line. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, I see. The eight, eighth inch hole for the hanger wire. That's you just hanging that. Uh, but to, to cut it, to cut those slits, uh, it's just a miter saw along the nice marks, like yeah um, so that's that's the growing towers we can um, can make some we also have have a bunch that are already prepared that we can just hang up so okay beds gutters shelves worms mushrooms build um, what else is required to make this the growing towers work. So you want a pump system. So let's look at some of the components that we have to make it work. So the workhorse there would be something like this. So that's we got a couple of these pumps. That's just a standard submersible water pump. It's like 27 bucks. It's got like 10 feet of head, max head, 9.7 9 feet. 
So the consideration there is you want to make sure it pumps all the way to the top of the tower. Now if you hang it at the very top of the pond, then you've got about five, four feet to go. So this would be plenty for what we're doing right now. And just one practical constraint is like don't put it at the very bottom in case you have some accident where a pipe disconnects and you leak out your entire pond. So put it, hang it so it hangs, it can hang by whatever you're attaching to, like whatever polyethylene pipe you're attaching to the top. So suspend it towards the top so if you have an accident, you're only sucking out a known amount of water and don't kill your system. So that's, that's a consideration. And how would you hang it? So we've got, we're going to have the 2x4, two 2x6 two board on the top, hang it off of that because the, the, fit, the pipe goes all the way to the top and, and to all the towers, just hang it from, um, you know, use some wire or some, attach it to the, to the ceiling and hang it. So, yeah. Maybe from the rebar. Or, yeah, if we're going to have the rebar across, which we actually didn't, didn't say here, um, on the QC part, um, let's see, where was our QC? Uh, yeah, so do the rebar support across. It could be like a board. We can just do a board. The disadvantage of a board is if you have, you know, it takes more space. Um, so rebar, I think half-inch rebar, that's a easy way to do it. Or we can just put up a board right across the middle. I mean, we, we can do that too. And then spill, make sure you're not spilling onto that board because then it will start leaking over the edge. Just put, make sure the towers are on either side of the board. That's all. So, I mean, um, reinforcement down the middle. So, if you have your, your tank like this, that reinforcement goes here, down the middle, where it tends to bulge out. Uh, it's got that's the weakest point. You want to support it across there. Um, so yeah, support it like this. If you do do a board, just do that, and you can screw it directly into the you know, what's below it. But you'd actually, because I mentioned those edge on because if you're screwing into what's below that that would be the edge of the board below that it's typically a weak connection so you want to reinforce that by um, how by maybe putting I don't know some pipe hanger strap just something uh, you just gotta gotta pay attention that, that that's a solid connection or a piece of metal that you screw into like across both so that's not coming out it's going into the perpendicular to the grain so but a little reinforcement would help there uh, screw and every 18 inch or every 8 inch? I thought I heard you say 8. Yeah, 18 inch, absolutely minimum. Like over the years, you'd want to, like for the professional job, you'd do 6 inches. Like if you really want. Okay. But for now, it's like 12 to 18 inches. Uh, 12 to 18, that's fine. Um, yeah, so that's, that's towers that's pumping. So you put your. Um, so you throw your pump in into the tank. So you just hang it. Yeah, you can hang that pump like off the mid bar there, or suspended from. You have to attach it somehow. Like here, you'd you'd use. If you do that, just take some wire or a zip tie. I guess zip ties are a convenient way, either here or at the top of the roof. So, uh, how do we connect? What are the next steps for the towers? Alright, step number one, uh, make or hang existing ones. We have a bunch of them in a old, the storage area, the old, old greenhouse thing. Okay, so how do you hang it? So let's find a board. I know we have some two by two by uh, two by fours. We can just use use that for now. We mentioned that 
the ones in uh, the first aquaponic greenhouse, they all bent up, but they were also on four foot centers. Here we have two foot centers. So actually two by four won't be too bad here. It'll be okay for now. So so hang hang a two by four across the top for for the tower area. <coughs> Just where you're gonna hang all the all the towers. Above the pond. Above the pond. And then along the pond. Yeah. Quick yeah. Was all the uh, wood that you used inside the greenhouse was it treated wood? It's treated. Everything you used in there. Yeah. Uh, well, the structure is all treated, and so is the top bar. But the pond, actually, we just painted it because it's right next to the fish. So it's treated stuff is not good for humans or eukaryotes. <laughs> mm. So you kind of want to be careful with it. That's where actually the plat printed plastics would actually be an advantage because all those chemicals are going to leach out of that and if you're eating your fish you're going to be eating the, the preservative in the wood so we just took the wood and painted it but you saw it it was it's starting to crumble that wood down there so that's where the 3d printed lumber or plastic lumber would actually be a great case for use using it so hang a 2x4 treated you have to consider that I mean those chemicals uh, and food systems are not not so compatible so just be aware of that so you're not eating directly off things that have been eating off your wood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like don't grow your mushrooms untreated wood. They probably, they won't grow because it's fung fungicidal, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, but like with the heat, do you think like the pesticides um, get into the earth? I'm, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. Um, but if you want to have the organic version, then you'd use rot resistant wood like cedar or black locust or other species like the jungle has a lot of rot resistant stuff mm -hmm. right um, off ceiling and how do you do that just you know two screws I think that the, the, the typical alternative to treated lumber for this context people use cedar coated in linseed oil mm -hmm. yeah so so there's the pond let's say we got the pump in there and we want to do two pumps just just as an experiment in resiliency so we can control these um, like if one fails we can have the other this just just to show uh, or we just do one if we don't have time but um, so then you got so you got your treated two by four hanging off the top all, all the way across across where the pond is so How many towers are we going to put in there? What's the tower spacing going to be? How much? How big do you want your lettuce to get? Well, I'd say like, <laughs> like this this space. Twice that then? Well, no, because the spacing would be that because the lettuce grows on this side and the other side. No. Are we building. So it's that would be the tower. If you make yeah. the sizing the equivalent to the product you want to grow. Like like if it's kale, it'd be like huge. But yeah, do do like 12 inches, like. How big is your head of lettuce get? Um, about 12 inches. We only have, well, actually that's quite good. Uh, that means 10 to the length, it's perfect. And then do two rows. I mean, that thing could actually fit like three rows, but maybe do like two that are easily accessible. Um, 20, 20, 20 towers in that. 20 towers times 20 plants, 22. 440 plants in that little area. So, 60 square feet for 440 plants, uh, six times 10, that's quite good. Like, you know, and eight plants. Are we going to do it before? Yeah, uh, getting to it. So let's, let's nail that what we want to do. So, so screws, so now put in a little screw for every tower, hang, hang location, and then Hang your so hang your tower after that with hanger wire. So so some some metal wire it could even be like the welding wire if we can't find any wire. What? Welding wire will degrade. That's not rust resistant. That will go away in a in a year. So do your um, 
So you got your wire. And I think the some wires actually may be on those those towers already. So you got your tower. It's like that. So what questions do we have? We have one five foot section. That's all that will fit in there. So the five foot section will pretty much be on the top of the top of the pond because it's the pond is about three feet. So it'll be just five five feet will be just perfect for that. Um, if you want to get a little more space, I mean, well actually. Oh, well, we have hanging locations every two feet, which are the joists. So you can also use that to hang things. Mm -hmm. But if you want it to be nine, in, you know, twelve inch spacing, then you got to hang a bar like this. Uh, so twenty towers. Hang twenty towers of five foot of five foot length. And then, so we got to attach the, the pumping to it. So um, we can, yeah, maybe that's not getting it. Let's go, let's go into the, the bigger things, which would be like growing beds and growing, uh, growing shelves. Let's, let's get into that. I know we have, uh, we're in a, our wood pile. And we have these, actually, these long troughs already. We could actually revive them because they were actually meant for another greenhouse. We never end up using them. So we can revive that. So. So next slide. Uh, why, why are we doing two by fours lumber? Because they were bending in the other. Uh, do we not want to try two by six? We don't have two by six. Two by fours are okay because now we have two foot spacing as opposed to four foot hanging spacing. Ah, okay. So we've got better attachments, so they have less chance to warp up. And is there something to get them to stick to each other, or do we go for one that's like cross the whole? They're across, like, so so where the one piece the whole across. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, they're eight feet. Them. Right. Um, do one is okay. which is eight feet, and that gets you right to the edge. You know, a foot from the edges. Um, I guess you gotta. I think, I mean, are we make the have two rows of them or just the one? Two rows. So okay. do twenty towers, two rows. Yeah. Yeah. Two rows <laughs> of ten towers. So you got your joists here that are supporting that every two feet. So, so your eight footer will end up actually right on the joists. And then you'll have three more in between. So every two feet, that's, that's your joist. That's kind of the joist pattern for the roof. Uh, but you attach the two by four to the bottom of the joists with screws. Um, what else do we need to know to, to succeed at this? What's the spacing between them? It's convenient so you can reach them easily, so you don't have to be bending over the pond too much, um, which would act actually make a case for like one or two more, like actually the pattern that would be most convenient would actually be basically like a square of towers where there's one so like even put once like where the dot is like right there so add like two more towers eh, not, not a big deal but just maybe just do the two rows um, but you do have access when you think about it six feet is quite a bit so the spacing between them yeah I mean uh, put them like maybe one foot in, so you got four foot spacing between them. That's pretty good. Like you're gonna get some shading from the front to the back, but that's actually just about right. Like four or five feet. Get them as far apart as possible so that there's least shading. That would be the consideration, while not letting the tower dribble out of the of the tank. Mm -hmm. You could also well, what if you have towers? You want more towers? You want to fill this thing with towers? How would you do that? Stagger. Well, don't or limit. Just make more rows. Where? In but I mean, I'm talking about the entire greenhouse. Fill the entire greenhouse with towers. What would what would you need to do there? Uh, collect put the water. a drain for them. Yeah. Cap the bottom. Put a fitting in it and run it into the the pond. So ah. they have PVC caps. 3D print your PVC cap. Um, mm -hmm. Screw in a fitting. A one half inch MPT fitting, and half inch or poly back to the tank so you can fill this entire greenhouse with it 
that would be one operation you can do oh, okay I want to just optimize for the number of towers how many how many can you fit like a hundred no not a hundred maybe like 40 twice as many about maybe three times as many I mean you can line well what is what is that what's the theoretical limit there like if you go so say you got your entire square filled with towers what's a good distance between towers it's like four feet so before that after that you get like a lot of a lot of shading we're not talking about auxiliary lighting you can do like your LEDs and all of that stuff but that's an electricity cost which would be okay if you want to optimize and you've got free solar mm -hmm. which pay which where solar pays back from the energy production in about one to two years so invest in more solar throw LEDs on it and you jam pack this with more than what we're gonna show here so but what's the natural lighting scenario so say every four feet if you've got so you got a row every four feet basically from one end to the next which is 16 feet so you got one how many how many of these can we fit like almost four almost five actually now, so the all the way still be able to support all those plants? oh yeah okay. oh yeah we've got um, it's a question of how much we talked about yesterday of intensive fish farming oh yeah that you you'll still if you do intensive you'll have way excess than you can do here still so 4 8 12 16 this is the limit of what could fit in there uh, so you basically you get the ones on the edges like right up to the walls mm -hmm. now if you got summer uh, why don't you do this here off the same pond do that they'll love it in the summer so you, you can s use the same tank to feed much more and you can intensify your fish culture but, how do but you let's get say we, we're not doing that to the tank Pump. same thing so you got pumps you can put as many pumps in there as you like no no sir the other there. way around like once it goes through how do you guide it back into okay the so let's take a look at the drip detail oh, okay um yeah you like what what happens the and turn it back to the uh, we were talking yesterday about the water like uh, what's the quantity yeah like what's the maximum quantity which we can like uh irrigate like how, how many uh, plants can we irrigate with one pump right mm -hmm. and, and we didn't come up a thousand what we did last time we had a thousand plants mm -hmm. um, but we we're also feeding the 10,000 nuts <laughs> 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 and that was plenty of nutrients we didn't do any supplemental feeding for that that was all the aquaponic water so okay so let's take um, that's 3,000 gallons to 10,000 plants so let's take uh, we got about 1,000 gallons here so we can do like 3,000 plants man you had it's pretty good 10,000 10, plants that was super intensive nut culture with every single shelf space taken up maxed out 10,000 plants in a in a trays of a hundred had a hundred trays of a hundred plants they quite a bit basically flourishing anyway like flourishing yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. would you say that's flourishing yeah yeah they're flourishing so we know it we know it can be done um, look at the bottom detail so what happens at the bottom drip detail so this is like kind of what happens if you this is like not taken care of that's like purslane that's a weed that's started growing in it but it'll get all moldy and slimy on you if you don't take care of it what happens at the bottom that's because that that's actually part because of the some of the issues where if you get too much root mass it'll just start flowing out the holes the, the roots get so packed in there like especially like mint mint just takes over but if you had yeah so if you don't take care of it if you don't harvest and then let it regenerate you'll get this the water will just spill and then you got all all slime and algae growing everywhere which is fine that's still fish food it doesn't look nice what happens to the water the water dribbles down the bottom so what happens when you cap it um, so cap let's say uh, tower cap detail and you can make this uh, we haven't done this we, we just typically ran straight to the the ponds because we didn't uh, need more space tower bottom cap 
So you have this system. I mean, the question is, what's a practical distance that you can now feed your system? Like, how much, how far can you go before this is not possible or it's like a pain to do? Well, so you've got you've got a cap at the bottom. I'll put a little elbow fitting. Let's see if we have any elbow fittings like this maybe so a tiny elbow fitting half inch and then you're running a so let's expand that view there so now you're running a a half inch line you know I mean it has to go by gravity because it's only gravity feed so whatever you're putting down there has to be at a lower point so it's effectively how much drain you know if you attach it somewhere to some structure you can get a nice slope that it won't uh, won't back up on you. You get a small slope, like a quarter inch per foot, you know. And there is there is pressure coming. From There's the yeah. If you cap that at the bottom, you're gonna have at least a little bit of pressure from the bottom outside of what starts <coughs> overflowing out of the first hole. If you're in a plugged condition. Yeah. So if you plug this up, you'll see water starting to come out of your first hole, on the bottom of the tower. Mm -hmm. uh, but if this is going, I mean, you can easily do like. I don't know, like, like another greenhouse. I mean, it's a bunch of plumbing there. So, so if you have a bunch of towers, you don't want to run like a single line from one. What you would do is you tee them into one another. So, say you got a bunch of towers like this. This is say this is outside, and the tank is, uh, say the tank is, uh, like that's the tank back there. I go uh, so if you, uh, a what? Gauge. Gauge. For what? Like uh, instead of the the Hoover, you put like a like a, like a system runoff system, like a gutter nope. or something like that underneath. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Well, so the point point about this one was you put a bunch of T's, or uh, you know draw a T here. So you have this, you have a T. So what's a T? A T is something that looks like a T. Uh, here you have this T screwed into the bottom. Uh, make that smaller. So you got this little T fitting at the bottom. So you get a multi bunch of multiple ones and then you need to run only one line to this. So you can have a whole field of these in one line limited by how much water you're pumping. So this tank, it's like, I don't know, like maybe like 16 feet would be practical, not a problem. Um, you some sort of screener or filter at the bottom of the towers? Do you need to... No, if you have a, some kind of a screen, you'll, you'll start clogging it up. So you want, you want like free flow under one kind of operation, like... The root mass should hold everything. Yeah, like if you've got some stuff that that's being filtered, like fish poo or algae clumps and stuff like that, um, or slime molds, whatever, uh, that just let it flow back into the tank. That's the easiest thing. Just keep it flowing. Uh, that's one way. Now, what if this tank, like, uh, hmm? uh, the the roots and the same soil are are the filters? They are. They're taken up. The filters, yeah. And you want that reticulated foam because it's got a lot of air space. Roots want air. Mm -hmm. They breathe. Now, what if, um, so that's like 16 feet. What if you want you have this detached greenhouse, but you want to hang a couple of towers in your, in your, in your living room? Completely doable. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in that case, what I would do is, if that distance to the greenhouse is so long, do a little sump. So, in, so this is one way. This is a gravity tank gravity system okay what if you have a really huge distance to cover and you can't do it by gravity to say it's up your house is uphill uh, where the, the house would have to pump back uphill so you can do a sump here so so instead of a, a gravity system going right into the tank like on the ground or in the ground you have like a you know five gallon bucket like below 
with a pump. So you'd have to now do forced pumping. And how do you how would you do that if you have a long distance to pump? A convenient thing is a is a sprayer pump, like one of these things. These things, but these things do need a filter. They'd get clogged up. These are, you know, twenty bucks even. You got this tiny one, one gallon per minute. Uh, it's not a lot. You got these. Uh, these these are typically high pressure, low low volume kind of pumps, like a couple of gallons, four gallons per minute. Uh, this one is four gallons for seventy dollars. Um, and about four gallons is probably like what what you'll have from one of our pumps here, like this one. Um, Why wouldn't you use one of the three printed? Uh, they have to be good enough. Yeah, you could do that. You can you can absolutely do that. You'd have to have one that actually works. Because this is now Yeah, this is now where you need some pressure. Say you gotta these things have twenty to fifty PSI or hundred PSI. That's high that's pretty high pressure. Um, that's enough, like if we three D print hydraulic motors that run on water for life track, those motors have to be much bigger. But that's another idea. Like PSI for hydraulics on a tractor are two thousand. What that means is that with a 3D printed pump set that runs at 100 PSI, you need a pump, like if the pumps are like, motors are this big, it need, would need to be 10 times bigger, but it would work. So that's a 3D printed drive for tractors. There you go. Water pressure at 100 PSI does that. That's a lot of force. The, you know, those 100 PSI, 50 PSI, you can't stop that with your hand. It's a lot of force there. That could be turned into mechanical drive. Um, we can go crazy on this, we, but we um, also yeah. w went through some pictures of Martian's uh, old greenhouse, and uh, whenever a pump fails, you'll, those plants will start to wither within like two hours. Oh, so we okay. even discussed like having a, a, a dual system, a, a backup in case in case you're away. So yeah, yeah so uh, definitely for 3D printed. Like so, that's one route. The other route is just a simple bilge pump, like a bilge pump what's it called like a sump it's just a sump pump it's exactly what it is yeah these things have like 10 15 20 feet ahead so you throw one of these inside a five gallon bucket they activate when the bucket is full and they just pump it back into the thing this is better because you wouldn't need a filter so that's a cool option too put you Put your five gallon bucket in there. So I'm gonna put this copy image into here as this is your sump system. Right there in your five gallon bucket. So now your your water line here, that you're now dribbling, you're connecting that up and just dribbling this into your five gallon bucket that's wherever you are. You can have on your windowsill, you have a little bucket underneath, and uh, you connect all these up this way um, for your pumped route. So this requires electricity and mechanical pumping. This other way, gravity system, uh, it's resistant to pump failure. You just have possibility of clogs. And you're also making it into an ebb and flow system when you have that kind of to stop and then push Yeah, oh, right. Push. Yeah, okay, Richard. Um, well, you know, assuming you, you know, didn't have the ability to, to use a, a, a gravity uh, tank, um, with, you know, the, the alignment there, would you be able to, um, you know, have a, a, a drain system, you know, in the bottom of, you know, let's say the pond, you know, underneath it, that um, has a backflow valve on it, you know, that connects to some type of yeah, tank sure. and just, you know, yeah. pump? Here, by the gravity system, that is... Um, like the safe route, I mean, that's the most resilient route. The next route is in your tank, you put a fitting at the bottom so you can drop, you can have that much more drop, just three feet more drop in our case. But then you're, you're going lower, or in a case where the tank is in ground, then you have more, more room even, because you've got like the depth of the tank. Yeah. Um, how do you do those tank connections? So for wood, that's, that's gonna be a little tricky. Um, for totes, it's very easy. In the case of totes, you use these things. So this is the secret weapon for totes. And uh, 
you drill out a hole, put in this thing, this rubber thing, which by the way is a great thing to 3D print. Uh, you stick in a PVC pipe and it makes a very tight, watertight connection. What can we do in wood? Uh, can we put one of these in wood and make it watertight? No, no screwing. Uh, friction fit. Just put some oil on it, soap on it, friction fit a PVC pipe into this hole, which expands. Uh, when you put the pipe in, it seals against whatever you cut the hole in. Um, so if you want to do a simple version of this in wood, yeah, would, I think uh, if you have thin wood, you can put one of these things in, and the pressure fit would still work against wood. But like, what about like in our tank? You'd have to seal. You'd have to do like the two-sided screw-on fitting to get the fit get the fit against the polyethylene. Because yeah, if you have a container of some sort that's solid, you can use this. But once we have our polyethylene tank, how do you put a bung at the bottom? That's a challenge. That's definitely a challenge and a dangerous failure point. So for this, which reason, we're not puncturing that anywhere. We're just letting it dribble up the top and have submersible pumps in there, um, which is a more resilient. Uh, what if you don't want to use a submersible pump? You can still use external pumps, but you have to prime them if you're going over the top of the pond. Priming means that you get the first flow against gravity because it has to go outside over the top if you don't puncture at the bottom. So in any other pump system, you'd have to have the prime. For the sump pump, you can't prime that. That has to be submerged. For one of these high pressure pumps, um, once you prime them, they pretty much stay primed. So you can use one of these, get suck, you know, get the suction happening. Priming means you you're just running it. Uh, maybe you have to have a valve where you actually pour water down it if it's enough, if it can't prime by itself. But these kinds of pumps, they say they self prime up to like a few feet. So in the case where we have that three foot distance, this probably would self prime. Um, it would have a good chance of doing it. It would probably have those specs here like for uh, control F self priming uh, self priming spray pump so like you know if you look at that it says um, what's it say for pump priming that's where that word comes from <laughs> But the, you would take a look at that and say, well, how many feet can it self-prime if you're designing this system? So here I would typically go to self-prime. Now it doesn't, vertical suction force of two meters. The pump has a self-priming function to prevent liquid from flowing back. It could be uh, installed above water tank, but it doesn't really tell you if you had this self prime what exactly is that number that would be a relevant number and they will tell you that typically maybe in another like, uh, one of the reviews says 10 inches oh 10 inches only so uh that could still work for for us if we mount the pump outside the tank because you can't submerge these mm -hmm. mount it at the top outside the tank and it has to prime over the edge mm -hmm. that would do it if you've got a full tank. If you don't have a full tank because you lost due to evaporation, then it won't prime anymore. Um, but yeah, so th that's just practical considerations. What we did in the actual, uh, this system, which I talked about yesterday. So this, this is what I talked about, the watering shelves with the fittings where the top shelf flows into the middle and to the bottom. We used a sump pump in that case. And we made it flow we just divide it into the two sides and they would eventually dribble down back into the, the same tank. Uh, but that was a case of the, the sump pump and it had plenty of head to do that kind of a distance, which was at the bottom of the pond, so four feet, plus like six feet at the top, so at least 10, 10 feet it, it would work with good flow. Um, just kind of like design considerations there. That's, that's your fitting there. Um, how you... The, you saw this the other day, uh, that that complicated fitting where you got the CAD. Um, so we got the CAD here somewhere. 
uh, designed it in Blockscat. That's another online. Oh, well, maybe they they moved. Blockscat is another simple designer. It's like it's not not FreeCAD, but it's just a simple designer for STL files for printing files. So that's what we did in our shelves here. Um, how do you design this thing? Took threads of one part from like this this other file from thread libraries, put it onto this fitting. I just combined a couple of parts and drew this up. Um, anyway, so we got the towers. Any questions on the towers? Can we install them? So 20, 20 of them hanging by hanger wire. We're not doing the caps on the bottom. That was advanced theory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll drip, drip, drip them right into the, t the pond, which is the most convenient, easy thing. Um, but in this system, like we were trying to get to the, the final count of the number. What's, what's possible on the interior? Since setting up on the exterior, like you know, that's like setting up another greenhouse, because you have to hang these towers from somewhere. So you need a solid structure. That's not trivial. You're gonna have a pretty solid structure out there. So it's like building another greenhouse almost, mm -hmm. minus the glazing. So if you got five, two, five sets, um, times five times sixteen feet equals like eighty feet times 20 t well um, it depends how far they're going like if they're going to the five foot by gravity then you're actually missing out a lot of bottom space you're missing out that three feet at the bottom of the tank so the ones in the back so say the tank is uh, if the tank were down here and you got like one or two these are every four feet so you're spanning like two of them with the tank itself Um, the other ones could be taller, but you'd have to have the sump pumping. Mm -hmm. So if you just reduce yourself to, oh, yeah, yeah. So th these are five foot sections. That's only 11 plants per. Ah, so I, I forgot. The, there was 22 plants per 10 foot section. On how many sides of the uh, pipe? Oh, but if you do that, then yeah, then you go back to, to 22 if you have a means to rotate them. Um, something like that or you use the backside just to start things and then you rotate it to, to get it to the full sun mm -hmm. um, but so yeah in theory you can do up still up to like 22 um, so rough number 22 times 80 is like yeah 1700 plants or so in this that you're taking to market mm -hmm. off this little module so to develop a robust business model around this as that building block and think about okay now we scale one module two modules yeah, uh, I think the numbers add up. So it's about 700, 1700 plants. And what we say about the maximum for our system based on a nut, nut breeding results, we had 10,000 plants, 11,000 plants for 3,000 gallons. So we got like 3,000 plants. So we're still well within, like we can double this and still support um, in non-intensive culture double this and still support all the plants with ample nutrients so that's pretty damn good um, and that's non-intensive so no supplemental oxygen like when they get into the intensive they're actually shooting oxygen not only air but oxygen like pure oxygen which uh, dissolves much easier than air in water so that's Where that's. It wouldn't be medical. I mean, wherever I think it's like Praxair. Like, where do you get? <laughs> air stones for aquariums. Really good. Yeah, that's that's the passive air. Where to get? Oh, okay. you just mean like using air stone or like uh, oxygen in the water? Like, you no, know, that we do. Falling water brings yeah. in oxygen too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or like a turbine, like in a wind turbine. Yeah. Connected to the pump. Yeah. Connected mm -hmm. to the to the pump. Oh no, no electrolysis, man. Just generated on site. <laughs> there you go. If you have ample PV power, you can go into intensive culture. But I would imagine it would be like chemical supply, like the Praxair, or like the industrial gas supply, probably. Um, yeah, you need a good way to separate the hydrogen, or it's all gonna explode on you. Well, separating electrolyzers—that's the easy part. Well. You can get, as long as you're venting stuff, 
you're never building up pressure that just all goes away faster than you generate it so that's okay um, yeah so towers any um, any questions on how to do that so we can do that we can so now air pumps air pumps and water pumps we can so we gotta run some power cords there but what parts do we use there so in this what do we use we use uh, one of these these are actually all hyperlinked so that's standard it's 20 watts 45 liters per minute that supplies like four or six air stones get a couple of them in there one would be enough I mean initially when a fish are young you just need like one or hardly any uh, but after they grow or you got intensive more intensive then full full power on this is necessary and if you want to go more intensive more than that but it's only 20 watts though so it's not a lot of energy um, so do that there's air stones and then little tubing plus air stones um, what else we got we got uh, don't want to get too confusing but okay so, but for the actual fittings on top of the towers uh, okay, it's, what's it doing there let's say here so these kinds of things that's convenient for if you use packs as the fittings on top so the trick to making all this work is connections you have all the components but all the action happens at the boundary so how do you connect things how do you not leak how are you airtight no leaks no bugs getting in all that kind of stuff that's the, that's the challenge it's all it all happens at the interface this is an efficient way to do your water connections if you use PEX tubing it's it slides in and that's it and to release it you have to hold to release it you have to hold on the on the round part and then you have to pull it out but this is an instant connection otherwise you take in maybe a barb fitting uh, kind of screwing the thing on there takes a little time put a hose clamp around it all takes time so if you got like 20 of these today you know you can do it real quick as opposed to taking you all day to just to make all the connections so that kind of stuff becomes important quick connects quick connect couplers uh, this is an example of a quick it's a pretty quick connect coupler for water water flow have you seen the tool they use for steel wire there's a special tool to make it into a loop and then tie it around the fittings so it's yeah. extremely strong apparently yeah that's good if you have a uh, little more time it's a little time uh -huh. I've seen that it's like Alaska cool tool yeah. is that what yeah, yeah that thing Alaska cool tool yeah it's just it's a piece of wire wrapped around the thing. piece of wire it's a, a t-shaped tool that you use to to uh, just to pinch the wire around the fitting it like, like in PEX or is it different than that it takes oh, skill yeah. though so it's not an entry level thing okay it's uh, redneck 301 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, so hose clamps uh, are, no, that's a, that's a cool thing, and I, look, I got all excited about it, but then it's, uh, it takes skill and it takes time. Yeah. But if you have wire, you got a perfect connection if you know how to, so if, if you're MacGyvering it and you don't have some resources, um, you can do that. Because look at these things, so 10 of these are, what is that, 10 of them? 35 bucks, so $3.50, that's pretty cheap. So that's good, and it buys you the time savings, which is worth it. So uh, take one of these, copy that image, and that's what you would do at the top here. Um, just connect the connect small stubs of hose wherever you've got the tower outlet. Just dribble it in there. Don't even need a tube on it. Just maybe dribble it straight from the fitting. So that's a quick way to do it. Um, let's use it. We've got those. It's all—all all this stuff is in the shipping area. We gotta open those boxes there. Um, so that's that's a convenient way um, to run it up there. You'll run it into one of these fittings, then go on to both sides. It's most convenient if you go both sides, so you use the available pressure more efficiently. People follow that. Mm -hmm. So 
I mean, this is gets all into the de like little details of how you would design this, but you don't want to like feed this pump at one end and have it go down the line because the first fitting is going to get the highest pressure and, and you're losing pressure over each one. So you don't know how many fittings you're actually going to be able to water with that pump. If you split it to both sides, you have a higher chance of getting more fittings because the pressure reduction is less because it's, it's a parallel circuit at that point. Um, so do that, like if you do that, so wh where we connect the, the water pump, you want to connect it to the middle. So say we got two water pumps, connect one to the one tower set, connect it at the middle. Well, you do it on the side if you have to. Right. Coming from both sides, you would equalize the pressure. You can do, uh, now we have two two rows, you can connect it in many ways. So. Mm -hmm. This is a way where we're taking one row and feeding it both ways. Mm -hmm. If you have the other pump, you can feed the other row both ways. What's the advantage or disadvantage of that? Is that how we want to wire it? Or a different, different wiring? We can connect one pump to both. We can connect the pump to one. What would produce the most resilient system? Two pumps, one system. Yeah. yeah. Two pumps, one system. Yeah, because if one pump dies, then at least you yeah. have something. So how do we do that? So let's go to the next page. Wiring diagram. So this is your hydraulic diagram. This is your plumbing diagram. Is there like a four-way T thing? Then you can connect the you two You can rows. connect two. We don't have, we haven't bought four-way Ts. They do exist. Mm -hmm. You can con create a four-way out of two three-ways. Out of, uh, okay. out of, so we have the, the three-way. We got like 20 or 30 of them. So, oh, we also have this, if you want to use this. This is PAX, PAX crimp, PAX fittings. So there, you attach it and then you typically put a ring that you clamp on it. So it takes more time. Mm -hmm. But if we need more fittings, we've got a bunch more. Um, this was actually for this stuff here. This is now getting to water solenoids. So we'll, we'll, we can start talking about that. What time we got? I mean, we, we could talk all day here, so I think maybe let's leave that for now. But <clears throat> let's uh, let's get the water system going. <clears throat> so how do you do? Um, no, let's sa save all of that for later. So wiring diagram, plumbing diagram. So if that's one one row, how do we connect one pump to both rows? Well, you'd have to fork it here so let's say that that represents one row of towers that's the other what do you got to do well you got to fork it so what's happening what is that joint there that's a T. So you got to T it out right there. Or T it out. No, no, I mean, the way you do it here is take this to the middle, T it out there, and then go into each side. So this is what you would want to do. Now you got a T right there. So you're feeding, you know, this side. And, on, and here there's another T where you're going off into this side once again doing it down the middle so you get the best pressure mm -hmm. pressure effects so you got a T there T there you're teeing there so here this is your other side here you know so let's put T's T's wherever the T's are but you'll see you need a bunch of T's there's a whole bunch of connections now when you, so this is one way to do it where both pumps will go in the middle right yeah. The other option would be to put them on the opposite corners. You could do like, you can connect through this yeah. end, end, but then you get that pressure reduction, like the, th the effect where you want one pump to, to go parallel as soon as you can so you can get more outlets more reliably for the same argument that we were using before, if, if you're following mm -hmm. that argument. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't want to connect at the end. It, it would you're work. You're creating a circle, basically, if you connect on both ends. Yeah, so but then the you have a dis. Well, 
you have to get okay so say you're feeding it from one side if the other side fails then this side has to yeah. reach all the way to the end across 10 mm -hmm. feet it will probably leak out on fitting like five mm -hmm. i don't know i have no idea I haven't done this wiring uh, so this is something where then you can start hacking it and say okay how do we get the same pump to pump to more outlets how do you think you would do it so we got the t's so you got you're pumping to the top you're going out both ways you're dropping t's to each tower how can you expand the distance that this water travels before it leaks out all the t holes make the outlet smaller you could make this outlet smaller but from experience we don't want to be doing that for mm -hmm. for purposes of clogging so i'm thinking that mm -hmm. half inch is an absolutely robust distance you can't get something clogging up one half inch mm -hmm. go three eighths little higher chance to get a hairball of something in there quarter inch yeah definite chances eighth inch you have to have higher pressure so let's keep it at half inch by design for resilience how would you increase the distance of one half that one half would travel more pressure you can yeah. do a different pump it's, what if we have the same pump how do you increase the this just a uh, pump higher. Downhill where? Well, you got to pump up. Pump up and then have it slide. Yes. Okay, yeah, that's a way to do it. So what if you did... Um, like a well, actually not... Design? Uh, some, yeah, almost like a reservoir up there, but <laughs> it would still leak. So right. the only way... There's different ways to do it. And one way to try it is if the fittings are actually pointing up. Because then you have to fit, fill all the fittings if they're down, it drips down the first fitting it gets to. If they're pointing up, it has to fill the bottom first. It all fills up even. That You can try that. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Try that. So, But let's see what the first first try does and, uh, and, and then go from there. In that situation, depending on how much pressure you have, it might actually still try and leave out the first uh, nozzle because it is under pressure. And then I don't know yeah. how much it is. It might actually yeah. hit, the, hit the ceiling with how... Yeah, yeah it might. It so that... That bend, you'd bend it around and down, so packs this, like if you're using these here, mm -hmm. that's packs. And if it's not totally level? Yeah, you gotta be level, you gotta pay attention to all of that. Uh -huh. So you gotta be careful how you do it, um, and it may, may be the same result, so we don't know. Yeah, uh, but the good thing is that all the... Have you tried the bio is going to stay down. <coughs> oh, have you tried doing better down. filtering from the pump side? You can do that, but then you're not getting the 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 wastes into the plants. That's the bad part. That's the bad part. Yeah, you can do that. You can get water, but where are you getting your nutrients? Uh -huh. well, How are you sending up all your nutrients? Nutrients dissolve into the water, or they yeah. actually like? But yeah, it will. But that means you're leaving more in the pond, so so you can only go so far before it gets too dirty. And you have to. That's a maintenance point. You gotta keep cleaning your pump. So exactly. I'd rather, I'd rather design something going, without that. Going down. No, no. You you put the pump into a, a, another container, so then the pressure is level everywhere, and then we don't have this. Problem. Yeah, kind of like that, and then it's level everywhere. So if you have enough flow, then that could that could perhaps work well. Yeah, if it's very even, because if you have a little right, slant, right. so you gotta, yeah. that's engineered. That's that's like getting into yeah. a little bit of engineering. So yeah. what engineering do we have up there? We have a relatively straight roof with the board that should be as, like, we should probably put a level there to make sure that board is level. So we're starting at least, yeah, you actually have to start getting precise in this if you want to make this work and work properly. Uh, so that this is why I'm saying this is like, this whole aquaponics thing is a very complex system. It requires a lot of different okay, skill sets. How about a bigger, like, fatter pipe? You can do pump. a fatter pipe, but, but yeah, like, to, to, yeah. No, no, because to, to avoid building something like this, you just have fatter pipe yeah, and it's never going to be full. And then you have holes in it. Well, if there are holes at the bottom, then, yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of things could work. The devil's in the details. You could use uh, well, that. I think right. the problem that we're having is if, it, but if then we you had need enough pressure to make it fill up, we wouldn't have the problem to begin with. Right. Just using small <laughs> that's, pipes. That's, no, that's but a point. Why, why it's, it's, a, it's not the pressure problem here. It's a, a, a flow flow speed. But flow and all of that is related to pressure. So it's yeah. all If you could only go five related. holes, you're still only going to be able to go five holes in this. Yeah, it's never going to fill up. 
So we kind of oh, have to play with, and maybe like the problem actually goes away from the beginning because we find that once we divide into like both sides, you're actually getting enough uh, enough leeway. So there could be like a like a dial. So how like a fine-tuned control? So what if like say the two end ones we had facing down because they're the farthest away, and the ones before that they're angled a little bit up and even more up. So you're kind of reducing the pressure available to the first, and then successively like getting that because you can twi twist this T to have the angle of where the pipe at what pipe angle you're exiting, which would determine how much back pressure you're putting on it. If you put it straight up, you've got the max back back pressure. Because you have enough pressure, you'll still get water out of that, but you're saving more pressure for the ones downhill. So that could be, these fittings lend themselves actually to fine-tune adjustment. You can t turn them and adjust the length of the pecs, because you still want to go neatly back into the tower. You don't want to be dribbling all over the sides, where it gets, over time, it gets pretty mm -hmm. biological on you. Well, what is the plant to need in terms of like, the speed of water? It just needs water. So if it trickles down or it's just fine. it's like a huge flow, it doesn't it doesn't matter? Okay. No. You just need to keep the plants wet. Mm -hmm. Keep the roots wet. What is the pump height of the pumps that we have? Oh uh, we said let's put it towards the top, which is towards three feet, like two and a half feet. Two feet between two and three feet. Like two feet. So it's on the upper half of the, the pump. pump. Itself? Yeah. So we we do that that drainage protection thing. So do we have the sump pumps or not? The, the We've got the these pumps. pumps. We've well, got the submersible pumps. pumps. Okay. We can also dig up the sump pump, which would be a an easy solution, but at the cost of more. That could be the other thing where those sump pumps, they're a quarter horsepower. They're not like 50 watts like these. They're much bigger, stronger. Mm -hmm. So once we start hitting these limits of the small pumps, we might say, okay, well, at this point, we just got to go to the sump pumps, which would work. Uh, they'll definitely blow this out, but you're using five times the energy if you're using it all day, in which case um, you can go with saying, uh, I'll turn it on for five minutes at a time mm -hmm. um, and do that. But it's every time you yeah, start up and, and shut down, you know, th that could work. Uh, in the heat of the summer, you want to make sure you're shorter than like wilting time because it gets really hot in there, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, so electricity use, I mean, you can blow the system out by just getting more power to the pump, getting more expensive pump. That's an easy solution. But if you try to do it more efficiently, you think about, okay, what exactly do I need and how much can it support? And can I be really smart about using available energy? Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we're trying to do here. Have you seen the design that incorporates water catchment for this, with water for rain kicks in, could be reused, or you, you would just go through the... Like, it thinks that it's a closed system, so we have enough water. Enough yeah, but, enough. but gutters are actually part of it. We can mount external gutters and have a pipe running from the roof into this R system. So, and that would be a good idea, because how do you do make up water? Yeah, we're you can water all the time. Ah, You're going to be losing water all the right. time. Yeah. You could use so like a float valve to, uh, like from an outside unit that catches rainwater, a float valve that, mm -hmm. you know, once it gets below a certain, um, mm -hmm. the pool gets below a certain height, then it'll it's bring more water in. Mm -hmm. And that'll bring it low enough to where it's not like cleaning up the system and filling everything in it. Uh, uh, you can't, cl with rainwater, I think it's pretty safe. Like, for example, in uh, Jeff's house there, we have. That system is not regulated, it just spills over when there's too much rain. In this case, it will also work if you have a rain, you spill you spill it, as long as the fish don't leak out. It depends if your fish are jumpy. If they like to jump outside uh, because you have bad conditions, they'll die. Uh, but if you have good conditions, they typically want to stay in, mm -hmm. so they'll be like, oh, cool, like clean water, rainfall. Oh, okay, that's good, okay. Yeah. <coughs> How would you scale this to the oh, no. parallel setup? Well, you have rain water can affect the pH of your system. Do you really need to maintain that? Mm. Yeah, you, you, you got to. Really so you have to do make sure that like whatever the rain catchment is, um, yeah, maybe have some kind of a limit, like uh, either by having a pipe that's small enough, or the whole area of the roof. There's only so much, or maybe you're feeding part of the gutter into it. 
because yeah you don't want to have like a huge exchange of water in like one hour no, yeah. <laughs> no you you want to be like on a day multiple day scale for that so so whatever catchment we're doing um, like what is the calculation if you get a four inch rain how much how much rain you get off a off a 256 square foot roof so I guess a and rain calculator where, where the zipper container with a, like a float valve would come in so yeah I could do that never adding too much um, so you have four inches times okay what's the volume go to volume calculator for like four inches can happen here like that's happens here and there so what would happen if we did that uh, we would have length is 16 feet width is 16 feet and then height is um, if it's four inches 0 0.3 so that volume there is 84 cubic feet um, times about seven gallons so so it's about 500 gallons so in a super super heavy rain you're exchanging a quarter of the water that mm -hmm. might be a limit of what you can handle in which case you might um, yeah yeah put the provisions like I'm just trying to say okay what's the mo what's the simplest least parts thing but yeah float valve yeah uh, what kind of float valve you have to take a look at that yeah um, some kind of a bucket structure with a float valve that closes on and off um, you have to pay attention though because if it gets clogged and it doesn't shut off then you know so you you want to make sure you're resilient whatever you design in um, yeah or just have a you know water level sensor that just shuts off a valve so how you do things like that if you connect that to Arduino you got these things for example uh, so I was looking at what are accessible larger valves this is one inch so it can handle quite a bit you know one inch is getting significant um, but that's you know 50 bucks cool but you can say we'll open open this valve whenever the you know the water level gets to a certain level mm -hmm. and one inch um, one inch might be like just barely enough to handle like a heavy rainfall it's probably in, from like a 256 square roof inch roof they'll be we probably need like a couple of these to to handle like a full heavy rainfall um, so that's uh, we should try the well I mean we can play with this so to figure it out, but I mean, the first thing is just try this and see if it, all the towers get wet, and that's that's mm -hmm. step one. So, does anyone have any other proposal for what a better hydraulic diagram would be? So that thing is where's this where's this other pump coming from? Well, we can connect just one. What happens? How do you connect two of them? Well, you have to tee in another one towards close to that one. Uh, but a lot of that water would leak down here, so you'd have to have a check valve mm -hmm. on one and the other. To prevent backflow into the other pump if the other pump is dead so check valve a uh, little ch inline check valve um, which so say uh, half inch now check valves yeah those like to be clean so half inch check valve you could get a easy one like just simple thing like this in line oh yeah five bucks uh, if we're using half inch lines, well those are three eighths, but basically you're letting water through one way and it doesn't flow back the other way. So do something it's like it's a water diode. <laughs> yeah, so use use these things. use one of those uh, on each line uh, we actually don't haven't gotten a half inch one we've is got other ones so that's what it will I mean we can feel free to just do one one pump and uh, but because we're trying to do both of them then we should do well let's we'll see how far we get with one uh, if you have two on at the same time you don't need that check valve it's more more for the pump failure condition so uh, we can add the second one but maybe maybe one is even enough for 20 I, I kind of doubt it though Some already um, have it built in as well yeah so we can try this 
Um, what else do we need to know about the towers? So that's one system. So what about, uh, we're like going into lunch. So let's do build outs in the afternoon. But what else do we want in there? I definitely would want a growing bed in there. So what's a growing bed look like? Open box. Yeah, well, yeah, it gets uh, it gets pretty heavy if you fill it with soil. So what I would suggest is if we do that, uh, put a bunch like layers of straw and soil on it, and the straw decomposes over time. But it's much more lightweight. It's much more humus, so it's lightweight compared to like clay, which is very heavy. Uh, so do a box that's like we would like to do something like four by eight, and then put a pot, once again pond liner so the stuff doesn't r rot on you. Uh, and then you do want to drain out of that because you don't want to flood the bottom. So you have to poke a hole at the bottom where you're leaving, um, uh, basically just put some kind of a fitting in there where you're doing the best you can. For, or, well actually, if you've got, um, just don't make the, the it like a pond, put the one piece of poly on the bottom and then put more like on the sides. So you've got a crack like at, at the bottom. That would that would do it. So you don't have to puncture. That's gonna be like a cleaner exit, which will rot your wood less over time. Um, so what's a basic design of a grow bed? I mean, grow bed could be anything. It would be as simple as as four boards on the ground in the space we have. But that's not a great use of space, nor is it comfortable. The grow bed idea is that you have comfortable working height, so it's really convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, so a convenient way would be to stand it on legs just like we saw back in our the photos uh, like where are the nice pictures they, they show the grow bed um, somewhere back here uh, I mean a grow bed is just comfortable main thing is about comfortable working height so you can plant things and without bending over and things like that it should be like soft enough that you can harvest a plant plant another one right away uh, let's see, do we have any evidence? Like this stuff in the front here, that's the grow bed. So it's, you know, it's, you see the black side there, that's polyethylene covering. And we had it where we wrapped it all the way at, towards the bottom, so we have to poke a hole at the bottom, and then that hole kind of rots first. So put a sheet on the bottom, so it still has that crack in between, and kind of like wrap the sides uh, a little bit around, so you're protecting the wood more or less. And should you do treat it there? I mean, not really. If it's in contact with things you're gonna eat, mm -hmm. so you don't want to do the treated stuff. In the in this diagram here, we've got treated for the the shelves. They are treated, but that's because the nuts are going out into the field. That's not in food contact. Uh, and then the polyethylene on top, so you don't have a lot of contact with with the biological systems. Um, so. So for a grow bed, let, let's do a quick diagram. Just one slide lower. Okay. Yeah, grow bed. So you got four by eight, four by eight sheet. Uh, do that. I mean, you have to support the bottom. That's a lot of weight if you've got plants and soil. For which reason, we've got the huge bale by the other house. We should grab like a whole bunch of it and, and use that as medium. Because if you just put plain soil in there, you really need lightweight soil mix. And one way to do it easily is take the clay soil here, but just put in a bunch of bunch of uh, bunch of the straw in it. And as it decomposes, it'll it'll work. You can start growing things in there, and then coat it. Put a coat of soil on top so you can the plants can establish readily. And then that 
the struggle get give it all the volume that's that's one way to do it like at a, at a low budget otherwise you get a whole bunch of bags of uh, a lightweight salt mix um, or or things like expanded clay um, there's there's a couple ways to do these things you can do them just like soil based or aquaponic more aquaponic based aquaponic based would be expanded clay pellets you can get this stuff but it ain't cheap either um, you know, this kind of stuff which which plants grow directly in it if, in a flood like you flood the plants that, that kind of retains the moisture it's expanded so the little little spaces between hold water but this is like 45 liters for like about 40 bucks so it's like a dollar per liter um, you know not too cheap um, uh, hay bales you can get for free you can get soil for not, almost for free um, you can get large round bales here for mm -hmm. like I think we pay like 40 bucks or 40 bucks for one or 25 dollars or something 25 dollars I think for the big bale that we have out there so it's it's relatively inexpensive Almost free. If you use uh, expanded clay, you'd have less problem with like mites and this and stuff like that. Stuff that lives in the soil. Yeah. Um, ideally, the ecosystem would take care of itself uh, in the best scenario. But if you use clay, you wouldn't have all your worms, right? They will get into the. They'll they'll go in there. Oh really? Yeah, because um, yeah they will I've seen this one farm where it's like they had this with the fish water and just worms all over the place uh, yeah in, in this medium so yeah the worms will love this stuff too it's as long as you got a moist environment that you can you know wiggle in these things are very light it's very light stuff so um, let's see copy copy this image you can have a bed like this we don't have the materials for this one um, so let's just use the soil based and that's like, in practically speaking, you know, it's probably if you got a whole bunch of these, you know, you'd have a bunch of cost in that. So that's 45 liters. Um, well, that was 40 ga uh, 10 gallons. How big is this bed? If we have it one foot deep, like four by eight, one foot is a good depth. That's enough for root crop. So do it, do it that deep. So that's 32 times, that's 32 cubic feet. How many gallons is that? It's about times seven, so it's about 220 gallons or so. So you need like, if there's 40, you need five bags of that. According to that price, that would cost you like five times 40, like $200 for that, for the grow medium. Well, you can pay that, but you can also get, uh, it could be convenient. It's, I think it lasts for a long time. Um, 220 um, well no 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 ho hold on there I, I miscalculated 220 gallons that's 880 liters so you're more like 20 of those bags 600 bucks or mm -hmm. that's a lot of, that's like nearing a thousand bucks for a bed that's not worth it I mean this stuff ain't cheap that's the thing um, maybe in bulk you can do better but that that was my first thing it's like you'd think this would be a little more affordable but any of these engineered media they're quite expensive so if you go to natural things around you you have a lot of biomass and such as straw or you can or mulch maybe start with that and add soil and over time it gets really rich and juicy like also compost um, but have as much lightweight medium in there because as you see, like that would be like six hundred dollars in clay for just you know that layer. But you can uh, just put a ratio. You don't have to put it a hundred percent. Yeah, but what's the other stuff? Why? Yeah, you can. You can. Isn't that but still just clay that's mixed with uh, like wood shavings, and they fire it so that way it opens. Yeah, up. it's fired clay that's got pores in yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, they, they use like wood shavings or something like that while the firing process is going. Uh, what's the name of this black, uh, black soil? Like it's... Um, Quicklin more? 
Coco Noir. So that's one, but the other one is like they, they do it in the, in the Amazon and it's been uh, like a, tech, uh, a well known technique that they uh, heat the, the wood until it's uh, carbon and then they spray charcoal. Ch charcoal. You can have free materials like charcoal that r oh, requires that production that time. So a charcoal so maker. You bury the charcoal underneath the plant bed, and then it can uh, like it captures. That's a great water. deal. But it's important to like once it's in a, in a, in a specific temperature, yeah. you have to uh, pour a lot of cold water so it can crystallize it, and then it's uh, like you put it as a part of the soil bed. Yeah. And uh, it helps retain the nutrients. Yeah, and also retains the water as mm -hmm. well, and keep, uh, so you don't have to water it. And it's very yeah. cheap wood. Yeah. They do it in the jungle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, charcoal is all good. Mm -hmm. yeah, if I, so you right. can if, if I can, I can make. If I can make a, uh, some suggestions of things that I've used uh, to fill in, like raised beds um, that are cheap. Um, uh, as much instead like mulch, like sometimes I'll do like 50% mulch, like you get like the, the mulch will decompose really quickly and will form like a very light mi mixture with your clay, clay soil or whatever soil you put in there, uh, and mulch is cheap. Uh, get the non-colored one of course, like no chemicals in it or something. Yeah, another thing that is quite cheap, it's like 4 50 or $5 per bag, I guess, and well, and one bag is 40 pounds, I don't know, but could be considered like pellets, but the pellets that you use for burning in the stove, they just basically, um, as soon as you mix them more, they'll crumble, they'll turn into sawdust, and it obviously like saves sawdust from any non-treated materials that you're cutting, that also goes into it, uh, leaf mold, so like the fall is about to start like you can rake in a lot of leaves like very quickly with a tractor or something um the disadvantage of the straw that martin was talking about because it's not straw it's hay right is that it has a lot of seeds um so i personally i i've learned to stay away from that and use more like the wood products like the the pellets and the mulch and leaves uh, just my two cents yeah that's right so what's the height of this thing? It's, uh, we want to make it comparable to a table height, which is like 30 to 40 inches. Something that's comfortable working height like, like this here, so you can, can be most comfortable. So that's, that's the main determinant there. So we should make it like, I don't know, like 34 in, maybe like three feet or 30 inches to three to four feet. So you're working, the top of it is, probably like around here and the base is there so you also don't have the legs aren't too long you could use treated like say the 4x4 four four treated for the legs and then or you can do a, a box I mean 2x12 is quite convenient for that for here so you do 2x12s for the box and then for the legs you can either do like a flat on 2x12 or just 4x4s 4x4s are a little harder to attach because you you'd need like longer screws uh, if you do legs that are flat on on the sides that's an effective way like in fact like legs that go like this on each corner that would make for a very strong connection um, with minimal lumber like two by fours or two by sixes or something like that and this would want to be painted for longevity otherwise it decomposes after a few good years um, so two by twelves now the bottom it wants to have a bottom that's going to be heavy so so that's that's the other issue so at the very bottom you want to probably have legs this thing is going to be he like really heavy like so this is big infrastructure so across the bottom so you probably want either um, two by twelve boards at the bottom and then probably a support across that because so, it will just bow out after some time uh, so, so this is like like growing beds yeah they're not they're not easy if you put it on the floor you can do that and then it's not as comfortable to, to work it. Like it's super convenient to, to, to put it at a height that you can work easily at. I mean, that makes a difference. Um, Cause otherwise it's, yeah, it does make a difference. So, um, so are these grow beds part do that. of the filtering cycle for the pool or is it just a matter of watering them? 
Uh, we can design it either way, but we had one that was just you water them. Okay. And if it's not part of the automated system, that's one little task you have to do. But it's not too bad. If you're, if you're managing it constantly, then yeah, watering it is not easy. You just take a bucket from the fish, fish okay. water and, and do that. And I guess the towers are enough to filter the water for the fish, so yeah. the, the rest of the stuff doesn't necessarily need to be part of that cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where, where we're at on that. Um, yeah, I mean, we can get out a bunch of 2x12s, and it's once again, it's we can look at the one that's in Jeff's greenhouse there. That's a good model. That's that's. Uh, I don't know if we have the blueprints for that on that one. I don't think we ever did because it was too easy to to just do like in place. Um, we can take a look at look at that. So height, I would say between like 36 to 48. I mean, 48 is a is a bit tall. Um, so maybe like 30 to 42 or something. Um, or basically like, yeah, I don't know, like 30 to 42. So top working height is like 42. That's a that's a good height. Um, relatively good. Yeah, uh, for for the straw there, we'd have to grab some from the the CD Go Home two site for the the straw. I, I would do that because man, you'll see like the amount of straw you got to put in there. That's it's a lot. You just don't have the like bags of compost or or like pre-made soil, like lightweight soil mix on hand. Um, yeah, but the straw the straw route is a practical one for this. You can get things to grow in there pretty me immediately. The way they some people do, like if you grow in cities on old sidewalks, they put a bunch of straw bales. You dig out little pockets, put soil in there, and you just grow. That's that's a that's a method. So effectively, like the equivalent of that, we're filling it with a lot of straw. Then you can put pockets of soil where you actually have that good growth medium, and then it all gets all wet and decomposed and biological in there and uh, full of nutrients. That if you have the aquaponics water, that's that's also providing the nutrients into that cyst, that growing bed. So it'll be a quite a workable system just with a with a straw. How many are we building? Uh, just one. Uh, so how much space do we have in a greenhouse? Um, there's, uh, if it's eight feet long, you could only fit one. So, um, I mean, what do we got for this? Yeah, and then we can also talk. We ha we've got these elongated troughs, but yeah, between these two projects, there's plenty. I think plenty for everybody, so we can get a team on. There's finishing up of the all the wall modules. Just the little detail, like the quality control detail, uh, getting the growing towers. A lot of the stuff, the raw materials, like the fittings, are on a shipping table uh, at the south end of the greenhouse. So we, we can unpack all of that. Uh, most of that is is there. Um, we can make it make it all work. But we can basically the polyethylene is on the side there. We can start laying it out, doing the corners, and just get the hose to it and, and f fill it. We're at that stage. We can pretty much fill it. I think. As, how are the corners? Do we do all the corners on it? So what we did there was things like um, corners, but make sure those corners are on there. there. There's like additional wood on the corners to prevent this from blowing out at the corners because we said that the connection of the edge on wood is, is pretty weak if you use screws. So we got these corners here like this kind of like buttoning this up more. That's what we did. Yep. And then you're getting screws into the, the cross grain to make a solid connection. And that's what we did. So finish that up and a few details. So yeah, let's break for lunch and, and get into this. Um, in um, the last link in the chat, uh, there's like five things we're signing up for today. There's a lot of work in, in, in the chat. Holy cow, five? That's uh, insane. Glaze, finish, build pond, build vents, build towers, build grow beds. Bed, grow bed. Take what, take what we have energy for. Uh, the main thing the, in priorities, I would get the water system and, and towers going. Uh, the other stuff, it's button up details. We, to, to make this work well, we'd have to, we'd have to do it. To, to actually get it going and started, we, uh, I would say the priority is the, 
the towers if we want to actually plant them tomorrow. So tomorrow's biological day where we plant things and spawn mushrooms and and duck Rita Zola if we want to and mm -hmm. other things. So yeah, I mean we only have so much time in a day to do all of this. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Where can I find the spec for the the towers? So Aquapana greenhouse page. Yeah, I'm, I'm on it right now. This is Go down to the build instructions. Mm -hmm. You see the build instructions? Not yet. So Aquapana greenhouse, there's index, it's called G-Towers. Click on the link. Oh yeah, G-Towers. And then uh, Martian, how do you feel about designs. Um, Instead of uh, doing the session in the morning, yeah, uh, maybe tomorrow morning go like at nine o'clock work three hours, yeah, and then for lunch we can come do this session while you know somebody's cooking, and okay, eating, and then we can work another three hours like in the evening. Yes, yeah. there's also the aspect also. that we spoke uh, about in the morning about uh, we can starting at eleven. Yeah, so Saturday Neil tomorrow. says Neil oh, says nah, I want it all. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Oh, I so didn't, let's see. Last Saturday is tomorrow. But yeah, it's tomorrow. Yeah, that's so uh, yeah, we should. I mean, uh, we've got plenty of things to do. So uh, yeah. we can. How are people feeling about that? Do the get right out there in the morning? Okay. And then we can. Yeah, I want to do it in the morning for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's do that. And let's break for lunch and uh, get out there at, at one. So I'll stop this. Okay.